order. A little bit of house cleaning. Uh, they have a, a mask rule here at, at Central College. Uh, I would like for people to use their own judgment on that, especially outside of the room at your, at your desk. I think we're fine not having it on. I'm not sure of that, but anyway, um, roll call, please. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. This is roll call for September 9th, 2021. Senator Bouchard. Excused. Oh, okay. Senator French. Here. Senator Cost. Here. Senator Wasserberger. Here. Representative Blackburn. Here. Representative Clausen. Here. Representative Fortner. Here. Representative Heiner. Here. Representative Larson. Here. Representative Western. Here. There you Representative Wharf. Here. Representative Winter. Um, excuse. Chairman Boner. Here. Chairman Eklund. Here. Senator Bouchard. Here. Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum. Thank you. Committee, first order of business is trespass of wild, feral, and astray horses. Um, our, our first people that will be talking with us is Shoshone and Arapaho Fish and Game. Uh, Arthur, Arthur uh, Lawson, director. Hi. So we have mics up here. Would you, would you mind coming up towards the front? So the way the meeting works for people who haven't been here is usually whoever's coming before us with testimony, if you don't mind, we have mics. We're also live streamed, so this can be seen uh, by the public and uh, don't want anybody to be nervous, but just kind of forget about that part. And, and that, but that's why we need these, need to be up here and mic'd and whatever. Yeah, yep, bring all of your cohorts with you. Better? All right. Okay. So I'm the director of Tribal Fishing Game uh, for the Shoshone and Apple Tribes. I'm also the acting livestock officer on the Wind River Reservation. Um, I'm definitely in support of this bill of assisting and helping us with the problem of feral horses. Uh, I believe that the amount of horses we have on the reservation probably starting to outnumber our wildlife uh, with the elk population, deer population, bighorn sheep. Uh, this is a huge problem. Uh, the damage that they're doing to the land and to themselves is a big issue. And I asked Pat Nilica to come and join us. He's our biologist for the reservation. Uh, I guess she's seen some of the pictures and um, stats and everything that he has that we're doing on the reservation. Back to add on to it, Pat. Sure. Thank you, Art. And good morning, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Chairman Uckland and Co-Chair Bonner, uh, appreciate being here. Um, <clears throat> I had, uh, my, my name's Pat Nellick. I work as a wildlife biologist and project leader for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in, in Lander. And <clears throat> our office and my role as a biologist is to assist the tribes with all things fish and wildlife on the Wind River Indian Reservation. And our office has been doing that uh, for um, about 80 years. So we have a longstanding relationship working with the tribes. And um, so I, at the previous meeting in May, I uh, provided some testimony online to the committee about some of the feral horse impacts that are occurring on Wind River. And I, I uh, wasn't gonna go over that again today since I'd already provided that, but um, if you'd like me to, I could. But uh, the point I wanted to make is that it's you know, a major serious problem uh, on the reservation. And <clears throat> there are thousands and thousands of horses. We don't have a, a firm number of what that is, but we do uh, intend to do a comprehensive aerial survey uh, through the BIA and Mr. Shakespeare can, can add to that. Um, this winter to address, uh, you know, to get a baseline as to the number of horses out there. The BIA had done some survey work in 2012, and at that time they had 2,100 feral horses on just a portion of the reservation. 
Um, and that's, you know, uh, going on nine years ago, feral horses can double in population size within three to four years. So you can do the math and, and uh, see that uh, potentially there's, you know, thousands and thousands of horses out there. Art uh, and his crew have been doing uh, some feral horse removal um, and Art can speak more to that, uh, but it's, um, a, but a lot more is needed because of the number of horses that are on the reservation. As Art mentioned, they are causing some serious uh, environmental harm to um, many habitats on the reservation and are directly competing with uh, the elk and uh, deer and other ungulates that are on the reservation, as well as legitimate, you know, livestock that are out there, cattle and horses uh, that uh, a lot of run on, on tribal land. So it's, it's a major issue. And, uh, and me personally, I'm very supportive of, of the bill that the committee has drafted. Um, and uh, to expand the relationship between, you know, potentially between the state and, and the tribes to address this issue. Um, I, just to give you a couple, a couple of uh, little anecdotal notes that I wanted to add. Uh, so yesterday we had a uh, tribal sheep hunter father come in with his son's bighorn sheep head. They have to register the heads with Fish and Wildlife Service when they harvest a sheep legally. And so he was in yesterday and he just couldn't believe the amount of feral horses that are in, in the area of what's called the Crow Creek or a Black Ridge. It's in the very Northwest corner of the reservation. And uh, which is right adjacent to um, the Spence Moriarty Habitat Unit, which uh, Game and Fish owns. And it's, uh, it's a state gem in terms of wildlife habitat for elk and, and other animals. And so um, he was amazed at how many horses he saw. And I said, how many did you see up there? And this is on Bighorn Sheep Summer Range. So these horses are at 11,000 feet. So there are no bounds for these horses. They will go wherever they need to go. And so they are directly uh, a threat, not only to all the lands on the reservation, but to state lands. In particular, this uh, Spence Moriarty Habitat Unit, which again, I, I used to be the district wildlife biologist for the game and fish up there years ago back in the 90s and it, it's a it's a state gem and it, and it is threatened by these horses even though there's only a few on on um, I, uh, what's called the mountain meadows area uh, which is part of the Spence Moriarty unit within the boundaries of the reservation there are a few feral horses there it's just the beginning um, you know feral horses are like you can look at them as invasives, as, uh, as weeds in a sense, um, because um, you know, they, they'll spread and, and that's exactly what they're going to do. So um, there's concerns for lands off the reservation as well from these feral horses. So that was, uh, that was just a couple of points I wanted to make to the committee and, and I'd be happy to answer any, any questions you might have. So thank you. Committee questions? So I, I have one, you're going to yes, try sir. to get a, a count on the number of horses. You don't have it yet. How will you do that aerially? Uh, okay. Yes. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, what we're, we're intending to do <clears throat> is to fly uh, uh, using a fixed wing. Um, it's a tandem small uh, plane and uh, you fly transects. So, you know, roughly a mile and a half wide transects just back and forth across the entire reservation and you try to count as many horses as, as you can you do it in the winter time hopefully when there's snow on the ground they're very visible <clears throat> um, so we should be able to count it, you never know how many horses you're missing because you will you will miss some uh, but at least it would be a minimum count as to what's on the reservation and then um, and then you can go from there. You have some baseline to compare to if you fly again in you know, a few years after you do some removal to see if it's changed. So, so one of the things that I've heard is that they beat up the range pretty seriously and there's very little grass left. Do they, after the grass is gone, do they eat sagebrush or how will they survive the winter? They do, so <clears throat> horses are, are, are very adaptable. Um, so, you know, they're primarily um, uh, 
grazers. So they're grazing on herbaceous plants, grasses, and so on, but they will switch to browse. So they will eat like bitter brush, which is a, a main uh, source of winter feed for mule deer in particular. And uh, some of the imagery that I had showed in May uh, showed horses really impacting uh, some uh, crucial winter range for mule deer where they were browsing on uh, bitter brush and they will switch to sagebrush too. So they'll, and willows and other things. So they will pretty much consume whatever they can um, to subsist, so. Okay. Is there any, um, any idea how, how much reduction of the uh, uh, livestock has resulted from the, the overuse by the horses? I don't have any of that information, Mr. Shakespeare. If somebody does, BIA. So we'd, we'd probably appreciate that. Okay. Uh, Rep Scott Heiner, Representative Heiner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What is the ideal target uh, for feral horses in, on, on the range? Do you have a target that you'd like to meet? Um, I, so we're just wildlife advisors. So I would defer to travel fishing game and the BIA, the, you know, the, the land managers on, on that number. Very little as possible. <laughs> Get as many as, as we can. Uh, they don't only just, you know, stay and eat sagebrush and stuff. They'll also start moving to where there is grass and where there is feed. So they'll start moving on the state side and habitat areas, like Pat was saying. And now we're seeing them in, you know, up high 11,000 feet in the bighorn sheep country. So they'll move anywhere. And they, like Pat said, they just multiply every four years. So we can get our numbers down to, you know, very, very minimum amount of horses out on the range units would be ideal. Yeah, Representative Heiner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So you've been doing some control measures over the past few years. Could you tell us what those measures are? Uh, right now with very limited funding, um, I've just hired tribal contractors to come in and help remove some of the uh, feral horses on range units. And so we've pretty much just been doing it by horseback and motorcycle and getting as many as we can, as many as possible. And those horses are taken to the honor farm or other facilities that, uh, and left in capture? Yeah, some have been sold to buyers. Um, a lot of buyers come in and buy them. We've uh, had some go to rural and uh, sell auction. We've sold some horses. And then a few of the very few good ones that we've, we've caught have been kept and are being trained. We're trying to start up a, um, a native youth outdoor uh, guiding school. So we are trying to keep a few of them for, for the program. Yes. Representative Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Can you explain to me, uh, since uh, the reservation is a sovereign nation, don't you guys have control over that yourself without the state having to jump in and do something or how is that controlled on that? Uh, controlled how, like what we do with them? You're a sovereign nation, can't yeah. you take care of it yourself? Yeah, we can get rid of them any means possible. Representative Heiner. Follow up to Representative uh, uh, Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, could you round them up and take them to a slaughterhouse? Yes. So your management is different than, than what the other yes. wild horses are. Okay, on the reservation. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. Oh, we got more. Yeah, no, another ahead. question. I just uh, so if I understand correctly, your limiting factor is funding. If if that's not the case, please let me know. But I mean, I think that's why we're discussing this today. Is that we have an opportunity here that does not exist in the rest of the state, given the sovereign status of uh, uh, both tribes on the reservation. And so, uh, you know, that's why we're talking about this committee. Uh, uh, but also, uh, so if that's wrong, I mean, please let me know. But uh, also, what, what's the cost per head um, in, in terms of uh, removing these horses that you're already doing? Yeah, funding funding's our big issue. Um, it's, it's our biggest holdup right now. And you're looking at 
$300 a head per horse or more, depending on how long you have to keep them, um, feed and water them, take care of them. If we have to bring in vets and everything else, um, you know, prior to when they first started doing the um, counts of the feral horses, the, the big roundups were costing between $200,000 and $250,000 per roundup. Now we're looking, the price of everything skyrocketing, we're looking at five hundred dollars to 600000 per roundup, which is way out of our, the, what we can afford. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, are you Mr. Shakespeare? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Superintendent, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for your time today and this invitation. I won't add anything that uh, Director Lawson or uh, Mr. Nilica has added as far as the impacts on feral horses on the reservation. I, I will add that the horse, this goes beyond a horse management issue. I believe this is an emergency as far as our um, ecological systems on the reservation, I believe as well as off the borders of the reservation as well. And to the point to where um, this is a sovereign nation, it, it is true. It, it is also a, um, as Director Lawson characterizes, a funding issue as a BIA does, um, part of its tenets and its mission is to help protect assets of the tribal members as well as the tribes as a whole. That includes environmental and natural resources. Uh, however, with that, uh, because funding is limited, uh, there is no direct appropriation for horse management. In fact, there's no direct appropriation for um, tribal fishing game. In fact, the tribes had to reallocate some of their funding that they received for ju judicial services to be allocated for fishing game to help with their management of wildlife. And so when you get to an issue such as the feral horses, there's you know, little to no funding to be able to manage a program like this. And I, Mr. Nilica has stated that we helped fund um, aerial surveys back in 2012. Those are done just on a uh, project by project basis um, when funding is available through supplemental requests. And we may be looking at what this next request to do an updated aerial survey to fund that. But as I said, there's no annual appropriation to be able to continually do that from a year to year basis. So which is why this problem has kind of exacerbated over the years. and. We have an enormous amount of um, feral horses out there. Uh, for our part, we, we aid and assist the tribes in managing that. And the way we do that now is making sure that, you know, the horses that are rounded up are seen by a livestock officer, brand inspection, um, make sure that they're, they're seen by state vets before they get sold or transferred to another area. That way we know, because, um, under the tribes and their jurisdiction, any of the natural resources and animals within the boundaries of the reservation is deemed tribal property. And so to be able to transfer or sell those, we have to go through that process to make sure nobody's stealing horses and make sure um, the proper process is done so those can be moved. Uh, in addition to that, um, as you touched on, you know, um, impacts on uh, livestock, uh, we're, we're doing an assessment now on that over the past couple of years with our cattle counts for our livestock producers on the reservation to see if that's um, impacted them negatively. Uh, we're, our review of the numbers is um, taking a little bit longer than expected just because of uh, the pandemic and COVID and how that may have impacted producers last year as well as this year as, as well. So we're actively looking at those numbers and we'll be able to add that when we get the uh, survey completed um, in addition to that, we know that, as I said, it was an emergency, characterized it as an emergency because of the drought situation, because of the impacts on the environment. We know these horses are moving off range onto roadways, and we see that as a, a safety, public safety issue. And so we've allowed our permittees, our lessees who have these different range areas and tracts of land to be able to police their own and do these mini roundups in coordination with of the Fish and Game Office. Committee questions? And just, I, I guess I, I, I benefit from understanding how the, the funding works from the federal government. So it seems like, you know, the, the feds expect 
the, the tribes to manage the, you know, uh, fish and wildlife or, you know, game on the reservation. But it seems like, I mean, are you completely dependent upon the federal government for funding or is there any opportunity for local revenue generation of some sort? Or I, I'm just completely ignorant as to how that works and uh, any information would be helpful, I guess. Superintendent. Yes. That's a very complex question to answer very simply. Uh, I think it goes to the issue that there, there is no um, tax base on the reservation because all the land is held in trust. And so you don't get any of that revenue generated like the state does through taxation. And so you don't have that um, funding sources to be able to fund different programs. And so they're largely dependent upon appropriations that the government's able to give them through direct services through self-determination contracts. But it is it is not a a uh, set part of a BIA budget a part a line item it can, or management of forces is doesn't exist in that. No, it does not. Okay. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Oh, one more. Okay. Vice Chairman, go ahead. Okay, just completely different topic, but you mentioned the survey would be done this winter. Do you have an inclination, I guess it's be a question for anybody, uh, when that survey would be complete? Um, yes, sir, uh, we're looking at January <clears throat> or February. It really depends. Uh, so the pilot that we use, uh, and this is a pilot that I've done a lot of flying with uh, for other wildlife surveys, but um, it, uh, pilots are pretty limited. And so uh, sometimes it's a little tough uh, scheduling wise, weather wise, et cetera. But the intent is January, February of, of this winter. Okay, yes, co-chairman, go ahead. And is that going to cover the entire reservation or is it just gonna be a portion of it like it was nine years ago? Uh, the intent would be to cover uh, the entire reservation. That's what we're trying to budget for. So thank you. Representative Clausen. Uh, Mr. Chairman, so uh, just for clarity's sake, so the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services role, I assume the Department of Interior has a line item that, is it an oversight role for the Fish and Wildlife or is it a research technical, what is it, what's the role that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service plays on the reservation land? Um, so uh, we, give you a little history. So we have been assisting the tribes since uh, 1941 when there was an MOU signed between the fish or uh, what was then became the Fish and Wildlife Service and the BIA. And so federal government has a trust responsibility to uh, sovereign nations like tribes to provide services. One of the services that BIA provides to tribes is fish and wildlife related type activities. In that 1941 MOU, they basically uh, said to the Fish and Wildlife Service, you will do that um, across the nation for us to assist the tribes. So that's how our role is kind of formalized uh, back in the day. And so we've been implementing that since then. Um, as far as like, we, we don't have any line item type uh, funding for feral horse related activities, but um, the funding that I get for, for our office is just for general fish and wildlife assistance to the tribe. So we help with uh, anything We're, we function like a game fish biologist. And so we help with everything from grizzly bears and wolves to sauger to you name it. So anything on the reservation, fish and wildlife related, we, we assist with. Representative Clawson. So just for clarity, so I have my head around. So, so you guys are technical, like the biology side, and then it, any decision-making goes through the through the game warden or through the tribal process that's that's correct right we're just we're advisors and um and yes the decisions are are with the tribes so if i'm if i'm understanding this the the tribes could decide to to pick a number of for how many horses you think how big a herd would be healthy anywhere from a thousand total to to zero actually um am i correct on that okay um we have our, our meeting legislative meeting I, I and i believe we may work on this next with this bill possibly some more in october um the aerial survey it'd be good to have that done before 
February, that's when our meeting is. And a number from the tribes on what they think a healthy herd would be would, would be useful in, in getting this bill passed. So uh, I think we might be done with you unless you had other things. Go ahead, Superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just like to add one other point that um, while this is topic here is focused on the reservation as a reservation problem, we know we're doing in the brand inspections for the horses that have been rounded up. Some of those brands came back to individuals who were other parts of the state, some up in the Gillette area, some up in you know, southern parts of the state. And we also had an individual who had a brand come back from Iowa. So, you know, uh, these horses out there are, um, to our understanding, maybe just getting dumped out onto the reservation and um, causing extra problems. And so you get those horses, extra horses out onto the reservation. They're obviously not bound to any borders or lines. So they're obviously going onto the state portions as well and could, could cause problems there. Senator Portner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you say you're open to, to slaughter. Uh, and I, as far as I know, federal law prohibits slaughter for human consumption. Would you be open for slaughter for a dog food factory or something like that on the reservation? On the reservation, you guys can get away with things as being an independent nation that we can't get away with over on the other, on our side. Would you be open to something like, like a dog food factory and slaughter of, of the horses that, that's not on federal land? Um, yeah, and that would have to come through both Shoshone and Rappel tribal councils to approve that. So that would be up to them. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I, I just had a quick question, sir. Um, you said you have a meeting in February. Do you do you have a date for no. when that might be? Just so that so, I know. So the way the legislative process works, we'll convene in February. Our session will be a budget session. It'll start, I think, maybe the second week of February. And most of the committee bills uh, will be passed and reviewed the process will be a committee meeting first if this bill is on there. Um, that information would be useful. That has to be the first, well, I don't know if we do the, we've had some rule changes, so I don't know if we have to do a two thirds on the committee bills or not, but um, we do have to, okay. So first process is two thirds vote, vote by the house of introduction on the, on the bill itself to go to committee, then it's assigned to the committee. This one would probably go to agriculture. And uh, an idea of what, what the tribes believe would be a healthy herd is, is and how many horses you do have and, and how much uh, loss to the livestock industry by the tribes would be, would be useful information for us, I think, and helpful in passing this bill. Oh, yes, Representative Worf. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've talked about the cost side of this. Uh, has the, the tribe looked at uh, revenue sources that they can generate? Uh, it was mentioned, uh, you know, a dog food factory. Uh, are you looking at other sources of revenue that you could also uh, generate to help kind of offset some of this cost that you're going to incur? Uh, yeah, we looked at uh, to, um, quite a few different things, but the, the biggest thing is trying to get the number down. That's one of my biggest issues right now. I'm pretty short-handed and low funding that it's, our, our biggest concern is the removal or, or getting them moved. Right. Maybe I think we're good. Thank you, gentlemen. That was good information. We appreciate it a great deal. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it, John. Thank you. So our next person will be Director True from the Brand Office. Welcome to our meeting, Steve. Mr. Chairman, committee, thank you. Uh, in the interest of prudent use of time. I have nothing prepared on this issue. I think we covered most of our role in Gillette. I'd be willing to answer any questions 
from the committee? Questions? Yes, Representative Heiner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we, we heard that some of these brands on the reservation uh, are from uh, other states or other areas. Do we, what, what's the uh, procedure if we find a, a, a stray horse with a brand like that? Do we go to the owner of the brand and, and have them come and get the horse or what, what's the procedure there? Mr. Chairman, Representative Heiner, thank you for that, that question. That's a good one. That, that, it follows our stray process the same as any country brand inspection. Uh, so, and we work it the same way on, a, on an MOU with the BLM for their gathers in that we look and we find horses that are branded or have some uh, significant identification marking. And then we'll track those through the astray process. The brand inspector will, uh, for example, the BIA, Mr. Larson, uh, Lawson and his folks will separate those horses. The brand inspectors will look at them. Under astray laws, we have up till 10 days to try to determine that ownership. Uh, and if we cannot, then we can trigger the, our disposal part of our astray statute on those horses. So first thing they'll do is I try to identify that brand. Of course, sometimes tracking that through different states can be quite a process. That brand may be registered in multiple states. Uh, if ever, no brand is particular to any one state. Each state has their own registry of brands. So there, there must have been some pretty good legwork to find the Iowa horse. And I comment, commend our inspector and, and Mr. Lawson for that. But that's that process. And it, it happens uh, from the, when the BLM gathers horses. If there's branded horses out there, they will sort those off. We'll research that brand, try to find the identification. Uh, you may find other things, other identifiers from, from local ranchers. Uh, historically, there would have been cases where sheep herders horses got away and went with the feral horses and some of those guys back in the days cropped the tip of an ear and stuff. So that's what, that doesn't happen much anymore, but that would be another identifier that the range cons or the tribal folks or our inspectors would say that's, that's likely an owned horse and sort them off and, and give them a closer look over. But that process works as the same as a strays for anything, for cattle, anything that 10 days, we have up to 10 days to try to determine that ownership. If we determine at day one, then we can go notify that owner, we've got your horse. This is the cost of feeding care that the BIA needs or the tribal tribes need to get him freed up or the livestock board if we find him somewhere else. So that it's the same process that we use for strays anywhere. Representative Blackford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So with that being said, with that 10 day uh, limit there and you destroy the horse after that, there shouldn't be a problem then on the tribal land or anywhere in the state should there for any horse that's been just dumped off? Mr. Chairman, Representative Blackburn, our statute has uh, dispose of, which can be sell, slaughter, destroy. Uh, so we, depending on, the, on what the astray is, it's generally sell, uh, public sale. We don't do any private sales strictly on a, uh, perspective issue, won't ever wanna look like we're doing anybody any favors, we're not. So there'll be a public offering to sell uh, and, and we dispose of them that way. So if, if, if the buyer is a slaughterhouse, if there's a high bidder at a public auction, then that's where they go. Follow up, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Representative. So again, I, I think what, I, what I'm trying to find out is when we have that limitation, whether you, whether you sell a horse, destroy a horse or whatever, that shouldn't be a problem. Stray horses should not be a problem in the state of Wyoming. Wild horses should be, stray horses should not be. Am I, am I following that correctly? Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Blackburn, that as Superintendent Shakespeare said, that's a fairly complex question because it depends on where the stray horse is. If he's in a wild horse group or a group of feral horses that aren't gathered for years and years, he's just one of them until the gather happens. Astray horses that we find upon brand inspection or if, uh, for example, Representative Larson calls our brand, his local brand inspector says there's two or three horses running around out here. I don't know where they belong. We'll deal with that 
quickly. Um, but if, if if there are horses that are running in those bands somewhere on public lands or or even in some checkerboard lands, we won't know that those are not feral or wild horses until that gather is made and that inspection is done. But at that time, we do deal with those horses in a, in a separate fashion. The, the presiding agency, be it the tribes, be it the BLM, be it the Forest Service, sorts them off and we deal with those horses inspection wise differently than we do their horses that they're shipping somewhere. But if they are un, just a second, if they're unbranded, there's a good chance you won't be able to tell them and astray from uh, from part of the the herd. There's no way of recognizing that. Extremely good chance, okay. Mr. Chairman. Yes. All right, Senator Boner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, do you have a rough estimate as to the uh, when you do these wild horse gathers, what proportion of them are, in fact, estrays? Does it vary a lot? Is it consistent? And if so, what's the rough ratio there? Mr. Chairman, I don't have a hard number for that. It, it varies a ton. Uh, you know, a lot of times the, the studs in those bands won't let horses join, so they might find a weaker band and there'll be 10 or 12 there. Uh, and then nothing in another 300 head because the studs in those bands won't let those horses join. So it, it's hard to tell. Uh, it, it depends kind of on the area too. Yes. So, so but in, in very rough terms, you're talking about maybe a dozen out of hundreds and, or is you know, that seem about, it's not like half or anything. It's maybe closer to five, Mr. 10%. Mr. Chairman, I would say ballpark 5%. Yeah, Representative Clausen. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. True, so, uh, of that 5%, those are, those are, those horses have definite marks, definite brands and, and horses that, it, they theoretically are dumped, but aren't branded or aren't marked or identifiable, or they're considered, they go with the feral horse program with the BLM and they're not separated, correct? Yes, Mr. Chairman, if they, if they're not identified, um, there, there might be some cases, uh, in a, some of this would have been prior to my time, but I've, I've heard of some cases where folks knew a gather was gonna happen and some of the ranchers would wanna come because they know they were missing some horses and they could claim that sorrel gilding that had saddle marks on him and that sore foot, you know, that sort of thing can happen in those cases. Uh, but we're operating on brands generally, but if, if an owner show or a alleged owner shows up and tries to claim the horse, then we'll work that one backwards. Yeah. Yes, Representative Winter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> Director, to your knowledge, uh, are most of these stray horses that you send down the road, are they going to killer plants in Canada or Mexico? They're on, for, just for the record, are there any uh, killer plants in the United States right now? Horses. Mr. Chairman, Representative Winter, there are no, no horse slaughter plants in the United States. So if anything is going to slaughter, it's crossing one of the two borders. Um, we have not looked at a gather in my tenure. Uh, this, will, this coming fall, if the gathers go as planned, will be my first year uh, in, my, in my current capacity with that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Just kind of so the, the committee knows when there's, when you have a horse that, that is unwanted, unused, untrusted or whatever, um, this would be a way of getting rid of them since we can't, I think you can sell them at the sale barn and they'd go load into trucks and, and go, to, go to a slaughterhouse in Canada or Mexico, but, um, Getting rid of them easier would probably be dumping them out on the reservation or BLM land someplace. It could it could happen easily, and they so that's why that's happening. There are a great many horses in the United. In fact, I think if I'm not mistaken, I think there are more horses in the U.S. today than there were when they used to use them in the in the, the turn of the century. I've heard that, and and great many of them are just unused and unwanted. Okay, 
Thank you, Director, for your information. So next we'll have Department of Corrections, Mr. Moffitt and Mr. Schumann. Welcome, gentlemen. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm uh, Curtis Moffitt. I'm the warden at the Wyoming Honor Farm. Um, relatively new to the Honor Farm, about a year still. Um, so we recently had our ag manager retire after 36 years of service with us, was Mr. Joe Crofts. Um, Mr. Schutman is here as a representative of the ag program. He's very knowledgeable of the horse program and what we do out there. So I'm gonna let him give you a brief overview of what our program is about. Morning, Chairman. I'm Travis Schutman. I work for the Wyoming Honor Farm. Um, currently, right now, we have a total of 169 horses at the Honor Farm. Um, our program is small in comparison to what the problem is in the state of Wyoming. All these horses are Wyoming horses. They don't come from any other state. All the horses that we work come from Wyoming. Um, it's probably one of the best partnerships I've ever seen. That's our partnership with the BLM and the men. It really works wonders for the inmates as well as the horses. So we're open to any questions we can answer. Committee questions. Yeah. Representative Clawson. Uh, just a quick question. So you, you breezed the number and I missed it, but how many horses do you uh, tame or send through your facilities yearly? Uh, I believe you said currently 116 will die and then they they go on to be adopted somewhere else. But what's the rough number you can do per year? Or maybe it's not on a per year basis. Maybe it's a two year, maybe it differs every time, but kind of what what's your turnover? We have two adoptions. We have one in the spring and one in the fall. And then our contract with the BLM is right at 175 horses. So we'll adopt out anywhere from 60, probably at each adoption in the fall and the spring. Yes, Representative Winter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Schutman, uh, how, how long have you had these 169 head uh, in your possession there at the farm. And uh, do you have much trouble getting rid of them? Our adoptions have been very, very successful. Um, with the COVID, we've gone to online adoptions through the BLM. Um, it's a huge part for us to have them on site, but it's not been an option lately. As far as the horses, we tried not to keep any of them about more than a year. So we really turn over quite a few horses. And um, as far as adopting them out, we have no problems getting those horses adopted online. It's been hugely successful for the BLM as far as price and placement. Representative Clawson. Uh, Mr. Chairman, so are you at capacity or is there ways to raise your capacity or is 120 yearly about where you're gonna peak out without some major changes? Um, we don't have a lot of cowboys that come to prison. And so <laughs> as far as our numbers on inmates, we're actually fairly low as well. And our whole program, we also have a beef program and we raise all our own hay. So unless we were able to get some more land to hay, we try to make the amount of hay we have match the beef and the horses to what we feed. So we pretty much are at capacity and our contract with the BLM is right at 175. Okay, or Senator Boner, go ahead. Okay, so follow up Mr. Chair. So is the limiting factor then feed? Is it, did I hear that correctly? Um, I would say feed and manpower. Um, of course, we have to staff and train and supervise the manpower as well. But yes, feed and manpower and staffing. Okay, Mr. Chairman, follow up. Go ahead. Uh, so when you say manpower, are you, are you talking about prisoners or DOC staff? I would say both inmates and staff. Okay, Representative Heiner. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Shoopman, great program. I, I admire what you've done there at the Honor Farm. I, I see the success that you've had and it is a, a value added uh, endeavor and I appreciate that. In your uh, dealings with other states, are there other states that do something similar to this or is, are there opportunities to grow this in other states as well? Because you know we need more cowboys. Maybe we need to expand this program to other states as well. There are several other states that have similar programs. I haven't had the honor of visiting a lot of them. I see a lot of success stories with them. Um, we're pretty unique as far as what we do. Um, we're a minimum facility, minimum for the inmates. So what we do is a lot different than having guys in shackles and chains. And there's a lot of different facilities out there that security actually works with. And I have a lot of people in the industry that have gone and helped and done clinics and everything at other places. And a lot of it's really self-taught. It's hard to get guys in corrections that know how to train horses as well. What, what would the cost be? Or do you have an estimate on the cost to produce one uh, tamed down adoptable horse of these 120 that you adopt out? Uh, those costs, I'm, I'm talking the, the machinery costs for the haying and, and vet costs and everything. The BLM will handle all of our veterinary costs as far as that goes. I don't have an exact figure as to what it costs us. Our labor is really cheap as far as inmate help, which is great, but I don't have an exact cost per horse as to what it would cost. I think it's fairly minimal. Yes, Co-Chairman Boner, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so you mentioned that other states have, I, I guess, other, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, facilities other than low security uh, that, that do these sorts of programs that maybe uh, is there an opportunity to expand this at other Department of Correction facilities this program if uh, the uh, manning provided by the prisoners is a limiting factor is there an opportunity to you know do it in a different location I would love to see it it's one part of corrections that really works really well for the animals and the inmates as well so I think there's a huge opportunity to expand that it just costs money. Would either of you know what the uh, rev revitism rate is with these inmates that have trained horses. I'll take a rough guess, but we don't have very many come back that have learned. Um, our whole program is about accountability, being on time, working hard. They get to see um, seeds go on the ground, the hay grown, the hay harvested. They get to see it be fed. They get to see calves be born. It really changes a lot of men's lives. The recidivism in the state of Wyoming is the lowest in the nation. I don't know how much of a part of that the Wyoming Honor Farm is, but I would say it's a huge part. And just to add, the, add to that, if I could, I think uh, the program here, you know, we put a lot of responsibility on these inmates to begin with. They have a lot of freedoms here, but they also get a chance to enjoy what they do. And I think uh, speaking to these inmates, they are, it's almost like they are out working and they're ready to carry those over. I know a couple on his crew the other day were talking about how they're going right back to ranching when they get out um, and have learned some skills that they could develop too. So I think overall Wyoming's recidivism rate is fairly low comparatively. Um, I would guess that if you look at the inmates specifically that go through this program, and I don't believe that's ever been done, I would guess that is even lower than, than our normal recidivism rate. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Oh, yes, Co-Chairman, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So is there, uh, when you adopt these horses out, is there a, I mean, do they pay, do folks who adopt, do they pay for that, or is there a revenue stream associated with this sort of work? All the revenue as far as the adoptions goes to the BLM, um, but there is a revenue from that that the BLM does. We get paid per head per day as to what we have on the facility. We don't get anything from the adoption. Okay. So 
Go ahead, co-chairman. So I know you just said you don't have a, a firm understanding what the costs are. Would you say that that, but if you had a guess, would you say that what the BLM pays, um, does that cover the costs? Yeah, I would say we're part of the only part of the Department of Corrections that actually puts money back into the fund. It certainly supports itself. Yeah. Representative Clawson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, sir. So the per day, per day per head, the BLM, uh, uh, I guess, uh, takes care of the, the feed costs and training costs and certain things for the, is that based on just the, their normal costs somewhere else? Or do you guys have some sort of special arrangement or is it just something that's worked out? It's through a contract. Um, our contract currently is five years. We're renewing that contract and that cost per day is just to, we're not trying to gouge the BLM by any means, but we do have to be self-sufficient in that. Yeah, Representative Fortner. Thank you, Chairman. You're talking that you have a huge success with your with your program, and I believe you would. Uh, any, anytime somebody works, it's better than them laying around and <clears throat> not, not accomplishing nothing. They don't feel good about themselves. Uh, would you use your program in the state of Wyoming for, for a pilot program to have for other inmates throughout the state? You, you think that would be a good idea? Uh, I don't know what kind of waiting list you guys have. I'm sure people don't plan on getting caught when they rob somebody or whatever they do. But anyways, uh, it sounds like you, you guys have no problem filling the vacancy for, for working with these horses. You think it would work throughout the rest of the state as well and try to bring down that, that prison cost to the taxpayers? I personally do think that the warden could talk to you a little bit about us what um, limits us on getting inmates at the farm as far as their classification. So just to touch on that a little bit, we are the only true minimum facility in the state now. They've done some readjustment. Newcastle was a true minimum facility, but they, we, the department has changed some bed layout and they have some programming up there. And uh, so we, the plan is to fill us up completely with minimums. So once we get through, COVID has limited us for transports for obvious reasons. Um, I think yesterday our count was at 214. We have a capacity for 299. Um, and since COVID hit, I think it was about 250, 260 was the average before I got there back in June of last year. And we've stayed around 220 to 200. The plan is, and I would expect this over the winter, we build back up and by next spring, we're getting close to that capacity mark, I would hope. Um, and that, that should expand that program just based on our bed, like our bed capacity with that. Um, but we will be the only true minimum facility in the state. Um, so we will get all those inmates that classify as minimum. And there's, I, I could go into a lot of how they get to that point, but it, it, it's based on crime, years left to discharge and things like that, so. Well, I think we're done with questions. Thank you very much for what you do and, and pass on to the rest of the staff that the legislature really um, appreciates what's being done out there. Next, we have Wyoming Game and Fish, and I don't see the director here. Is he on line or does he have a representative? Oh, here we go. Hi. Mr. Chairman, we have Deputy Director Bruce on. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, committee members, um, Angie Bruce, and yeah, I'm representing Brian Nesbitt today. He sends his regards. Um, I also apologize, I'm having allergies here, so my throat is very scratchy, but I will try to squeak out a few thoughts today for you. Um, I don't have a whole lot more to add than what's been said, but one thing I would like to point out that I've really noticed recently, and um, communication with wild horses on the landscape is it's apparent to me that the general public does not have a really good complete understanding of the effects of too many feral horses out on the landscape and what those uh, what that means to quality of ranch land and quality of wildlife habitat and so the department is looking for ways to help communicate that better 
Um, we will have an article coming out in our magazine soon and, and just looking for other ways to discuss this issue. And so I really want to praise this committee because I think your discussion here today and at past meetings and in future ones does exactly that. Um, <clears throat> and as Pat explained in his talk, the impacts uh, to wildlife habitat, we're starting to see more and more. And there's also a growing body of evidence to even suggest that um, high, too many um, wild horses on the landscape may um, affect our sage grouse populations as well. So this is very alarming to us um, and we're reviewing some new research um, that's bringing this to our attention. Um, but just in closing, I'd like to say that the department um, is more than willing and we continue to collaborate with the BLM and the Forest Service on roundups and anything that we can do from our end um, to ensure that we do not have too many feral horses on the landscape. So again, I apologize, I'm losing my voice as we go, um, but I would stand for any questions. Um, committee, questions for Ms. Bruce? Yeah, Representative Fortner, go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I've worked all across the Red Desert, uh, east to west, north to south, and uh, I see a lot of these areas where the wild horses is at is sage grouse habitat areas. What kind, of, what kind of harm are we doing to the sage grouse habitat by wintering and, and taking on this extra horse herd that that's, we actually don't have pasture for or room for? What's it doing to our sage grouse population? Could you answer that for me, please? Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, they, they, like Pat talked about earlier, is the horses will feed off a sagebrush. And we know that sagebrush is a critical component to many of the um, seasonal, uh, um, seasonal habitats that sage grouse need to survive. So not only is it a food source, but it's also that winter cover as well. Um, this, this new evidence that I mentioned earlier is showing that this competition for the sagebrush ecosystem between horses and our wildlife could have um, population effects. If we continue at a rate of increasing about 20% a year, we could see as much as 70% decline in the sage grass population. That's pretty extreme. Um, if we were to maintain where we are now, we're looking at more of a 50, 60%. Now this study was done in Nevada was on probably a little bit different circumstances, but if it's anywhere reflective of what may happen in Wyoming, it's very alarming. Follow up, Representative Fortner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What, what areas are impacted the worst? Would, would it be the hill areas, the lowland areas? What, where was your biggest impact on your sage grouse at? Is, the reason I ask that is, or will we be looking maybe at, uh, instead of having a uh, fence-in law in Wyoming or, or a fence-out law in Wyoming, make it maybe a fence-in law where we have sage grouse habitat, fence in horses out so that they're not in that area, they have fish and game fence in instead of everybody else fencing out? That's my question, I guess. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, um, that. The areas, of course, that are affected the most are those big open sagebrush landscapes. Um, they're definitely the ones where we see the biggest impact. Um, you did help hear Pat earlier this morning talk about the horses moving higher up in the landscape. Um, you know, that, uh, I don't know if we know the full effects of that yet and how widespread that is across the state. Um, but we do know that the biggest impact will be to those sage grouse ecosystems. And the fence in versus fence out law, um, I would have to maybe lean on our ranchers about the feasibility of that. Um, but anytime we can protect the sagebrush ecosystem, um, the better it's going to be for sage grouse. Go ahead, co-chairman. Uh, yeah, I appreciate the, the testimony, but I mean, if you could just give a little bit more detail as to what role the game of fish plays, especially in uh, you know determining the 
a uh, number of wild horses of the, you know, do you play any role in that as the fish and wildlife in, in the driver's seat there? What just, and, and even if you play a role in the actual roundups too, if you could just describe briefly what uh, the Wyoming Game and Fish Department does, uh, you know, uh, and doesn't do as part of this uh, uh, process. Chairman Boner, excellent question. Yes, so I'd be happy to. Um, so we really lean on, when we talk about what those appropriate levels are on the landscape, we lean back to the Horse and Wild Bureaus Act where they described those um, appropriate management levels. Um, during that process, I'm sure the department commented um, like we do with most federal actions. And those management plans were developed using biological and habitat capacity analysis. So they really looked at what was the appropriate level on the landscape and, and we support those management plans. Um, where our concerns are is where those numbers are higher than those AMLs is where um, we are concerned about. So where our role also comes in is like with most um, NEPA process with our federal agencies, the department provides biological reviews of all of their roundups. Um, and so we look at things and see how our hunters are going to be affected, how um, and, and for the most part, this is a supportive role that we're providing BLM. Recently in one of their roundups, it overlapped with some of our hunting seasons. So we worked really closely with the BLM in order to um, send a letter to the hunters that may be affected by the roundup. And so they had awareness that this was happening. So does our game and fish have a, a line item cost uh, for removal of these, of the wild horses? Uh, Mr. Chairman, no, we um, do not physically help with the removal of the horses. I would lean on BLM for that. Okay. All right. Do you, um, does the fish and game have a, have an idea of how many wild horses are in the state of Wyoming? Um, Mr. Chairman, we um, fall back to um, the BLM's counts for that. We um, do not do our own aerial counts, um, such as what Pat with the Fish and Wildlife Service was describing that they were about to do on the reservation. Okay. All right, committee, I think. Thank you, Ms. Bruce. And this, just for your information, the smoke up here in, in the Lander Riv Riverton area is much worse than it was when I left home down in Cheyenne area. Good, well, again, thank you for putting up with my squeaky voice today. And um, I, I look forward to your follow-up discussion here today as well. Okay, thank you. So the, the next, on our uh, list here is our federal agencies, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Ser Service. Are they here or are they, are they virtual? Gary. Mr. Chairman, I believe we have the BLM on the Zoom. And okay. Mr. Nil Nilica is in the room as well, if need be. He spoke a bit ago. Okay. All right. Got a couple other names here. So we're we're finished with that. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, no, we have the BLM on the okay. video right now. That's what I needed to know. Thank you for coming and and state your name and good morning, uh, Chairman Boner and Chairman Eckland. I'm Kim Liebhauser, the acting state director for BLM Wyoming. Uh, currently I appreciate the invitation to be here with you. We did email uh, some testimony to you yesterday. It's very similar to what we've already shared in May. So what I thought I would do is just share some of the updates that have occurred since May, if that works for you and certainly be willing to take any questions that you have. Um, I did hear a question about BLM's horse numbers, the capacity and the numbers we have. Um, the HMAs 
have the capacity to support 3,795 horses. Um, currently, we are double that of horses on the range at about 7,700 horses. Um, we do have two gathers scheduled. One will occur down in the Rock Springs area and along the checkerboard in about the first two weeks of October. Our intent is to gather about 3,500 horses at that time. Um, and then the second one will be in the Lander area and that will occur uh, sometime in the second quarter of 2022. So probably the spring or summer of 2022. And that'll be an additional 500 horses um, then. So um, as you know, this is a complex problem and will likely need some complex solutions. And so we appreciate the opportunities that we've had to meet with the governor's office, um, also with members of the legislature to identify additional opportunities. And some of the opportunities that we've talked about have to do with a law enforcement program that BLM um, has where law enforcement agencies can adopt horses um, for their own purposes. And I think that might be an opportunity worth exploring locally. Um, also maybe help with our fertil fertility control, getting other folks trained up in those kind of actions in compliance checks, um, expanding the adoption program, helping us with aerial surveys, and maybe talk about additional contracted facilities. And so we look forward to continuing those discussions. Um, the Honor Farm is one of uh, the crown jewels of the BLM in terms of programs. And I think that um, it's wise to look at exploring what other opportunities do we have for similar type programs. So um, I don't have anything additional to offer outside of that. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions and thank you for your interest and support in helping us find those creative solutions to this complex problem. Representative Clawson. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. So uh, do we, you said there's 7,700 estimated on the range. HMAs is roughly 39.75. How many uh, wild horses does the BLM care for in kept kept captivity, excuse me? And uh, how many of those do we estimate are gathered from Wyoming if there are such numbers available? Or maybe that's outside your realm. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Representative, I don't have those exact numbers, but I'm happy to get those probably fairly quickly for you. Okay. Representative Fortner. Thank you, Chairman. I, I just asked the fishing game, then I'm gonna ask BLM. Uh, what would your thoughts be if state of Wyoming legislatures passed a law that says all BLM that have problem horse areas has to be fenced in? You guys, could you guys afford to do that? Do you have the revenue to do that? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman, Representative. I don't think I could comment to that. Of course, if there were some kind of, uh, um, <laughs> program or projects that we identified that were important to fencing, we would go through our normal budgetary processes to seek that funding. Um, we'd also have to see how that, how that works with our current program objectives. So um, I don't think I would have more to offer than that. Yeah. Chairman Boner, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So just uh, so I understand with if the gathers are successful this fall, will that get you within the appropriate AML or how close does it, does it get you? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the 3,500 horses for this fall would certainly address the AML issues in the Southwest part of the state getting us to AML. Um, I don't have exact numbers of what the statewide uh, AML targets would be. But, but again, we can get those to you as well. The, it would, 3,500 horses goes a, a really long way in this, in this gather process. 
Okay, Representative Fortner. Thank you, Chairman. It seems to me like the state of Wyoming has been over backwards time and time again for Bureau of Land Management with the horse, the, the uh, wild horse epidemic, I, I'm gonna call it. Uh, it's been going on for years and, and other states has tried to crack the nut and they've not had much success. We're looking at a, a bill to, to vote on here today uh, to set in place for legislative session. Uh, and, and a lot of this stuff, it was, we're just going backward. We're going to pass, we're going to probably pass a law this year that with this bill that says that, you, you know, we're going to hold some accountability to the federal government. But in reality, we can't do that because you guys pull a lot of the purse strings when it comes to financing the state of Wyoming. But anyways, uh, we got, we're, we have, we're at a tight spot where we got to, we got to be accountable to the people we serve. And, and we also got to be able to work with the federal government. But when the federal government ties up all the, all the loopholes to where we can't do nothing, then, then we're forced to do something. Uh, if, if we gotta, if we gotta help the reservation out with, with processing plants for, for dog food or, or whatever it's gonna take, uh, we're to the point now that we gotta do something. Uh, we've dug our feet too long. Uh, I hope you understand that. Thank you. So, well, um, I had a couple questions. Lander gather, is that going to be, will those amount to reservation horses, uh, wild horses on reservation lands? Those horses, Mr. Chairman, will be um, part of the HMAs on the public lands that BLM manages. Okay, so they won't be part of the, the reservation herd, herds. Um, and then on the, the numbers in captivity that are held by the US government, if you could get those numbers to us, before, we will we'll be meeting tomorrow too, but if you could get those numbers to us and, and back to our staff, and it'd be, it'd be interesting to know that and useful for us to know that. Mr. Chairman, any, we'll, we'll do our best. Let's see okay. what we can find there. Any other questions, committee? Yes, Co-Chairman Bowman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now we heard from our Department of Corrections about the Wyoming Honor Farm. I'm glad you mentioned it in your testimony. What would be the process? You know, we also heard about the payment uh, that goes uh, from uh, your agency to Department of Corrections to help pay for the upkeep of these horses. Uh, would the BLM be able to uh, support additional uh, similar programs at other Department of Corrections facilities? And if so, what? What does that process look like on your end if we're looking to you know, expand that program? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm not certain what, uh, what our capacity would be. What I would say is that we certainly have seen that um, across administrations, Wild Horse and Burrow Program is one that we're all trying to pay attention to, try to find new creative solutions. So I don't think anything is out of the realm. I think if uh, an institution was interested I think we would suggest contacting us and see what the process might be and how we could explore that. Yeah, Representative Clausen. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, when selecting sites for, uh, for BLM, BLM holding facilities, is there any consideration to take it into local feed resources as far as, and then uh, as, as far as the ability and then the competition from uh, or competition for for local livestock uses and uses in general, and then uh, is there has there been thought to to moving some of these facilities further east, where uh, it seems like the, we're inundated in the west with the further east, where uh, where it might be uh, more practical for adoptions and that sort of thing, and, and a bigger feed resources, say the eastern uh, the eastern United States. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Representative, I don't have the numbers, but we actually do have a fair number of facilities in our eastern states, east of the Mississippi, where uh, we hold horses. Certainly would be happy to get those uh, numbers and facts to you. I'm not sure if I understood the first question about, um, what, was it about competition with local uh, resources or I apologize. Representative I follow up or clarification question. The, the question was more to when these holding facilities are cited, uh, 
is, is local feed resources or competition for uh, local lives, livestock or production livestock taken into consideration in the siting of where we put uh, wild horse facilities, holding facilities? Mr. Chairman, um, certainly there's, you know, consideration of all the resources, but what I would say is typically what we've been doing is uh, our contracting folks are pushing out regularly um, a call for proposals for holding facilities all over um, the United States. And that's, uh, that's where we get the interest and the opportunity for citing these facilities that are typically, um, we're moving to, to see more contractor held uh, facilities like the one that was recently opened in Wheatland. So um, I think those are mostly going to be contractor driven locations, if that makes sense. Representative Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you mentioned the 7,700 or so, uh, that's throughout the state. And I, I guess my question is, uh, are they kind of consolidated in, uh, in the Red Desert or, uh, or throughout the state? I know up in my area, we have a couple, couple herds up in the Northwest. And, and I guess I wondered, uh, are, is it throughout the state that you'll gather them? Uh, Mr. Chairman and Representative, we, of course, are always planning for gathers in our HMAs across the state. This gather that I mentioned about the 3,500 horses is going to be in the um, complexes in the southwest Wyoming. Um, and I'm, for some reason, forgetting the names immediately, but primarily along those checkerboard lands um, out of our high desert district across Rock Springs field office and, and in those areas, I apologize. Okay. Well, if there aren't any other questions, thank you for your, your testimony. And thank you. Next on our agenda is the Wyoming stock growers. Good morning, Mr. Magagna, and come on up. Good morning, committee members. Jim Magagna with the Wyoming Stock Growers Association. First, I wanna thank you for taking this issue up as we had requested it as an interim topic and very pleased with the work you're, you're doing on it. Uh, a couple of updates I will provide you just briefly. And, and I would point out that there was a paper I had submitted prior to the last meeting a legal research paper that formed much of the basis for the draft legislation. I do now have a refined updated version of that available. I didn't wanna burden you with that, but if you would like me to submit it uh, to LSO for your information, it's, uh, it's very well done by a University of Wyoming law student. It's currently out for publication. So we're, we're pleased with, with that. Uh, a, a couple of just updates, I would say, not repeating any of the testimony that I previously provided um, and, and updates because the current drought that's invaded much of Wyoming, particularly the southwestern part of the state, has really brought some increased emphasis to this wild horse issue. Uh, you know, as, as research has shown, uh, a horse isn't a cow. Uh, a wild horse or any horse has a much more significant impact on the resource than a cloven hoofed animal, just by the way they behave, the way they trample the ground, et cetera. So we're seeing more of that in this uh, current year of, of drought in Southwestern Wyoming. And it's an impact on the limited forage that's available. Some areas in the, within the HMAs uh, didn't really even green up this year. So uh, horses are consuming a little bit of everything that remains there including sagebrush. Uh, water supplies are very limited. Many of those areas are dependent on reservoirs that fill with spring runoff. Those reservoirs didn't get any water this year. So the horses are more concentrated than they typically would be. So in terms of impact, it's, it's just far more uh, significant out on the land. Uh, another factor that this has all brought to light in the last year or two and, and Representative Clausen, uh, 
referenced this somewhat too, is that as, as a ranching industry, our position has always been, get the horses off the land. We don't care what you do with them, just get them out of here. Uh, we're having to take a little different, broader look at that today, because as these horse facilities are expanding, the one in Wheatland that was referenced earlier, uh, I just had a call yesterday from a, an attorney working for county commissioners in a county in Nevada where a new horse holding facility of 4,000 head has been proposed. Um, he was looking for input on the issue of their concern, what the impact that would be on hay supplies in that area for the local ranchers. And while it might be good if you're just selling hay, the reality is that uh, tremendous amounts of hay are purchased by, by BLM for these facilities. And uh, we need to have some consideration what that impact is on, on hay supplies. Uh, in those areas where large areas of land are taking up for pasturing private land, pasturing facilities for wild horses, uh, quite frankly, that's taking land out of food production at a time when food security is an important factor on, on a lot of people's minds in, in our country and globally. So those are all additional factors that I think are worthy of, of some consideration as we move forward. Just a brief comment on horse numbers and um, uh, acting director Liebhauser provided BLM's numbers uh, and what the impacts would be. And, and I would just point out uh, two factors. One is that when BLM calculates numbers, uh, they don't count the current year's full crop. So for example, her number of 7,700, which I would concur with is correct use of their data. Uh, if you're talking about gathers this fall based on BLM's uh, calculations that there's an average 20% increase each year, you need to add another 20% to that. Uh, we've seen significant evidence based on other counts that have been done that we believe that the annual rate of, of growth of the herds is more in the closer to 30% than it is 20%. Uh, seen data that shows 27 to 30%. If you use those numbers with the 20%, I would offer a number that potentially today there would be uh, 8,900 horses out there, less the gather that took place in 2020. And I don't recall the numbers on that. I think it was approximately 1,500 heads. So um, anyway, uh, close to seven to 8,000 head that are, are still out there and, and will be even with this gathers takes place. So uh, those numbers are, are also a concern. Uh, beyond that, Mr. Chairman, I have several comments with regards to the draft legislation. I don't know if you want those now or you wanna wait till the committee uh, brings the bill forward for discussion. But as far as general comments, I'm happy to take any questions, but that's all I would have at this point. Well, I, I think now would be a good time. Committee, did you? It, if you, um, committee, if you had questions uh, for Mr. McGagna first, and then we'll take the comments afterwards. All right, no questions. Comments on the on the draft bill. Thank General you, Mr. Chairman. I, I certainly we fully support the, the intent of the draft bill. I have a, a couple of uh, things I would bring to your mind. Um, have some concern with. Um, putting this Office of State Lands in the position of dealing with claims by private parties um, for, for, for a couple of reasons. One, those claims may well be different. If, if a private landowner is gonna file a claim for damages, uh, that may be based on a value that they put on an animal unit on their private land, which may not be the same that, that the state uses. Uh, uh, there are different factors out there or more water developments on the private land. The second is just in terms of the proper roles and responsibilities of the state land office. Um, representing private landowners in a matter like this, um, based on my experience, having been the director of that office at one time, I think really falls outside the, the scope of their responsibility. And it kind of confuses the issues. And, and then uh, the legislation as drafted provides that the money comes into state land office, it's held for a period of time and private landowners have to make then a second uh, claim seeking reimbursement. Uh, I think that's a very complex way to handle this. And on that particular point, uh, my suggestion for your consideration would be that 
We leave it for the private landowners to submit their own claims to BLM if they choose to do so. Uh, but that, and, and the state land office would not be involved in those. They would be, if, if they're honored by the federal government, they would be paid directly to the private landowner independently because they're the ones that are harmed. And I think it would, it's gonna be hard to justify a payment to the state for money that uh, is actually due to a private individual. Uh, and then would suggest though that we do input, insert into the bill uh, on page six prior to line 18, a subsection that enables a private landowner who has submitted a claim to the BLM to uh, share that submission with the Wyoming Attorney General's office so that the, the state land office would not be involved in the private claims. But if the state attorney general uh, moved forward to see, seek a writ of mandamus to, to mandate payment, that the attorney general would be authorized to include those private claims in that uh, writ of mandamus. So that they're, they're, they're filing that writ on behalf of state lands, as well as on behalf of any private landowner who had independently submitted a claim for compensation and shared that claim with the attorney general's office. I think that's just a, a, a clearer way to, to proceed on that, uh, particular issue. Uh, just a couple of other minor items, I suppose, with regard to this. Uh, I noticed that it provides that the money that's collected, assuming this payment is made after a period of time, goes into the state general fund. And I would suggest you consider the fact that uh, the state land office is doing this on behalf of state trust lands, and that those dollars, therefore, should go into the either the permanent land fund or the um, operating fund to be available to support those entities that are supported by state trust lands. And that it's not appropriate that those would be deposited into the general fund. And uh, I, I do have a question again on beginning of page seven with regards to the attorney general filing a writ of mandamus. It says it may include private land so long as private land compromises not more than 10% of the total area of affected non-federal lands. I'm, I'm not understanding why we would limit that to 10%. I mean, the, the attorney general isn't gonna file a writ of mandamus unless there's clear benefit to the state, but whether it's 10% or 20% or uh, maybe it should, the state land should be a majority, but I, I, I just don't understand the, the basis for the 10%. Uh, the rest of the bill in general, I think is, is very appropriate and very good. Uh, there is a reference uh, on page five, line 12 says that the lease rate per animal unit month for Wyoming grazing leases, just as a clarification, I would say for Wyoming trust land grazing leases, because the intent is that the state land lease rate that that we currently pay as, as lessees would be the rate that the state would use in, in calculating their, their reimbursement request to the, uh, to the uh, federal government for the horses. So just, just clarifying that might, might be helpful. Those in general would be my comments on what I feel otherwise is a, is a very good piece of legislation as has been pointed out by some members of the committee. Uh, there's no guarantee that the federal government's going to write us a check for this. Uh, uh, the writ of mandamus, I think, provides some, some strength behind filing for these dollars. Uh, but even if we don't just automatically receive a, receive a check from the federal government, I think it strengthens our hand in working with the federal agencies, in working with Congress, maybe to get some more prompt action on this issue. So. In, in that sense, I think there's real value in this. Uh, the final point I might make, Mr. Chairman, I was intrigued by I Representative Fortner's comment on fencing. Uh, would be really nice. I, I see some concerns. One, given the land ownership patterns, uh, most of these state lands and private lands are very much intermingled. 
either in checkerboard where it's section for section or just out in the desert areas where there are smaller parcels of state and private land and, and the, the grazing industry is dependent on having those open spaces. If, if we were, even if we were successful in getting the uh, BLM to fence their horses in, that means they would be fencing around each of those private and state sections, which would make them virtually unusable as part of grazing operations in the state. So I, it, it's in theory good. I'm, I'm concerned how we could do that in, in a practical way. The other thing I would point out is while we are a fence out state uh, for cattle and horses, uh, not for sheep incidentally, um, the BLM is not bound by that. So uh, it, if, if I don't want someone's cattle trespassing on me, it's my obligation to put up a fence to keep them off. Uh, we've never been successful in the argument that it's the BLM's, if, if my cattle trespass on BLM land, I can't say, well, it's, you just need to build a fence if you don't want my cattle out there. I'm, I'm in trespass under federal law, irrespective of what the fact that we're a fence out state. So I, I see some challenges there, but a good topic for discussion. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'd again be happy to take any questions and encourage you to move forward with this legislation with, with some appropriate amendments. Representative Larson. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you for uh, your testimony. I guess I have questions uh, being uh, your organization probably would be dealing with a lot of this. Um, and then you said that, you know, the state lands shouldn't be the one that is presenting for the private uh, property owner. Has your uh, entity thought that maybe you should take that up as an organization to do it for them? Because I, I guess my big question is, I, I can't imagine too many uh, would take that on themselves. Mr. Chairman and Representative Larson, I think it's going to depend. For example, uh, the largest affected private landowner with wild horses in the state is the Rock Springs Grazing Association with over a million acres being much of which is impacted by the horse population. I think they would be in a position to prepare and submit their own claim. For, for a lot of, of, of smaller entities with less acreage, I, I think your, your point is very valid. Uh, it's something we'd certainly be willing to look at, at is how we might provide coordination for that. Uh, if the committee's feeling is that it ought to be done through a government entity, I've, I've given a lot of thought to what's the appropriate government agency, state agency. I, I don't believe it's the, the state land office. It, it perhaps could be the Wyoming Department of Agriculture, perhaps the Wyoming Livestock Board. I'm, I'm, I haven't quite figured out a preference there, but I, I think it's outside the mission of the state land office in exercising their trust responsibility. But certainly in the private sector, uh, we could work together with other organizations and create a, a central place where people could submit those claims and then we could we could submit them to the federal government on behalf of numerous private landowners and we'd, we'd be more than willing to look at that. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh. Yeah, so Mr. just uh, on the bill draft, it, it strikes me that, you know, and just my initial and general thoughts is that maybe the first part where we have a very specific procedure is too prescriptive when we're talking about specific legal actions that the attorney general may take, you know, it, and then of course the last part where we're talking about working with the federal government and with the tribes, it's maybe not prescriptive enough um, in that, you know, we, we need some sideboards there maybe, but uh, uh, do you think it's appropriate to say in statute, you know, you may do the, you know, may seek a very specific legal remedy or will we better serve to keep it a little bit broader? And say maybe say you uh, the AG may seek to compel the United States to basically fulfill their obligations, say you will do this specific thing. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Chairman Boner, uh, I think that is appropriate, uh, and I'm trying to find where that is in here to look at the exact wording on it. The, the Attorney General may seek a writ of mandamus. I think it's appropriate. It doesn't rule out other remedies that the attorney general may employ that are in their basket of goods to work with, uh, but it does uh, bring to their attention one avenue that, that we believe uh, would have appropriate legal standing and, and would be uh, a clear way forward, but without precluding other ways. 
uh, I, I would be concerned if that were a mandate to the attorney general to seek a writ of mandamus, that, that maybe that's going too far, but as, as a suggested alternative and as a way to bring to the attention of the, the federal players that if a request for reimbursement is not honored, that we as a state and you as a legislature are uh, open to looking at subsequent legal action, I think it's very appropriate. Representative Claussen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. McGagnett. So, so I'm an overall supporter of, the, of this bill and this idea of I, I think we need to move forward with something. Do you see a risk factor with the uh, with the idea or the the general idea of the the Bureau of Land Management writing a check for uh, for damages to private land and somebody doing a cost benefit analysis and saying, this is gonna save us a whole bunch of money if we just write a check and go on with our life and not do gathers and not manage these things to a reasonable level in general for for, uh, for federal lands. And I know it's it's fun to kick the BLM around, but this is a very complex issue and it, removing these is, is very important for for lots of, lots of other reasons, but can you see that as being a risk factor, simply financial? For Mr. Chairman, Representative Clausen, I, I certainly understand your point. I don't see it as an unacceptable risk in, in two ways, I guess. First is that uh, if this legislation goes forward, this is not going to lessen the state's efforts through all means possible to foster the proper management of these horses at the right management levels. Uh, it, it's not, it, I, I don't see the state saying, oh, now we're getting paid for this so, so we can keep getting more money put all the horses you want out there. So from the state perspective, I don't see a problem. From the federal perspective, I think there are mandates under the Wild Horse and Burrow Act to manage these horses and to respond to requests for removal of horses on private and state lands uh, remains in place and remains just as strong. Uh, so I, I, I think it's a good point, but I, I'm not concerned that it's gonna lessen the incentive for the federal government to, to act to remove these horses and putting it in a balanced way where they're choosing with the limited number of horses they can remove in a given year, well, should we remove this many more horses in Wyoming or should we remove more horses in Nevada or Utah or Colorado, wherever the case may be? I think this could actually be somewhat of an incentive to them to say, well, you know, there's an added cost to keeping these horses out there in Wyoming that, could well approach a million dollars a year or more with the private sector involved, maybe a couple million. Uh, let's give some preference to reducing numbers in Wyoming before we reduce them in Nevada, so to say. So, yes, Representative or Senator Wassenberg. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I did. Many years ago, I was a representative, so thank you for recognizing me. But I do have a question. Many people remember that. But uh, I do have a question for the director. Um, has any other state directed and used a writ of mandamus for for damages of horses on on federal and state lands in this way? And so I, I'm wondering um, if this is new or if it's been used in other states and if it's gonna be successful. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Wasserberger, uh, to provide a very precise answer, I need to look back at that draft document that we prepared, but I, I do have some recollections of what a couple of states have done. Uh, new Mexico actually went so far as to put into legislation, I believe that Horses found on private or state land are the property of the state. Uh, I don't think we want to go that way because that's a property we don't want to have as a state. Uh, and there's one other state, I'm, I'm struggling to recall which, I believe it may be Utah, that created some legal authority or some legislative legislation that provided some authority for state legal action. I can't tell you as I sit here that it was specifically a writ of mandamus. I don't recall the use of that legal terminology in the Utah legislation, but I could certainly look into that further. Follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
so my my compliment to you on the handout that you gave the committee i read it actually for the second time and and yes the the committee bill that we're looking at is based on that and so i think it's a, a great direction to take um my question would be could you provide us the um uh, legal document that the student from the University of Wyoming has written so that we could look at that also. I would appreciate it. Thanks. Mr. Chairman, I will certainly do that. I have his final version, which is not much different than what I provided you prior to your first meeting, but it's it's been refined and I don't think the conclusions are any different, but it's it's been cleaned up somewhat and I, and I, I can uh, make that available to LSO. In fact, as soon as I'm finished here, if you'd like, and they can provide it to you whenever you you would like it. Follow up, Senator. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I, I do have one question. And so over the years, Wyoming has dealt with the federal government and, and one of the issues has always been federal mineral royalties and what percentage the state receives. My question is, if, if we go ahead with this bill and let's say we down the road, uh, the bill is placed in the statute and we send the federal government a bill for damages on state lands. Would it be uh, appropriate to assume that they might react and take a percentage of that FMR, which so let's say our, our total bill to the federal government for grazing on state lands was $50,000 and they changed the FMRs by just one percentage point, which would cost us about 20, well, millions of dollars as everyone knows. Is that something that, that could possibly be a result of this? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Wasserberg, I'm certainly not at offering legal advice, but my, my thought would be that uh, the percentage of federal mineral royalties come back to the states has been set by Congress. It's, it's been reduced in recent years from 50 to 48 based on the cost of administration. Uh, I don't see where the federal government legally could take something like this and compensate for it with any adjustment to those uh, royalty rates or payments. Okay. Yes, Representative Winter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. McGagna, uh, you are as well of, uh, no, as well as anybody in this uh, building or anybody in the state of Wyoming, I guess, as to how long this program is and this problem has been going on. And to my knowledge, it's been since the late 60s anyway. And nothing seems to be getting done by the BLM. Uh, and I think that uh, it would be well for, um, if, if you could just go back and, and relate a little history as to what has happened over the years and where we're at today. And do you also know of any study that indicates the, how much time our federal ranges have to, to survive under the current circumstances? Uh, I think this, this bill that we're discussing uh, may have some uh, benefits uh, as far as um, getting the federal government's attention. And I've, I've spoken with Senator Lummis about this and she feels the same way that it, nothing seems to work and that this might be another way, that, another avenue that we can go to go with to uh, get their attention. And I, I guess money talks. And so uh, maybe I, th I think we're on the right track here with based on what uh, alternatives we can actually get accomplished here. So uh, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, first, uh, Representative Winter, and, and I don't want to take up a lot of time here because the history of all of this could go on for an hour. But, uh, you know, prior to the passage of the Wild Horse and Burrow Act in 1971, there were right, these horses were out there. Frankly, the horses that were left out there by the ranching community, and they originally raised horses for the military and, and uh, for their own use. And then as that declined, they would gather fewer and fewer horses. And that's how these herds began to build up. But prior to 71, there were regular gathers that took place. I 
we call the individual who used to do them on much of the Red Desert every year. And I was out there when they were doing them. But uh, once the, the law passed, uh, it still worked fairly well as long as the BLM could follow the law, which said you remove these horses and you dispose of them. So the problem is was created, actually, frankly, by Congress when Congress has, I don't remember when it happened the first time, but has provided each year that these horses cannot be sold for slaughter. And, and that's what caused this problem. So I, I will say this, and I often do, that this is an issue where the BLM has some sympathy. I'm not saying they've handled it perfectly. They've made, they've made a number of mistakes, but their big problems were not of their own making as much as they were the making of Congress and, and their hands are really tied in what they can do. So uh, to that extent, uh, I think a piece of legislation on this can be used positively in, in two ways. In one way to get a little more attention from the BLM and get them to move a little more quickly on some of these matters and, and uh, move in better coordination with the state. Uh, but secondly, I think the message that this delivers to Congress and, and how you know Senator Lummis or other members of the Western delegations can use something like this as a tool to really point out, and I think this is a comment that can well be made on the floor of the Senate, that it was the federal government that granted these lands to the state, these trust lands, with a very specific direction that they are to be managed to optimize the revenue to support our schools and whatever else particular lands are designated toward. And now it's that same federal government that is negatively impacting uh, the ability of the state to do that because the state's responsibility is to protect the integrity of the resources and they're using their wild horses out there that in many cases are destroying the integrity of the resource. So I think there's a pretty strong political argument can be built there that might garner some support, support beyond just the representation of, of these Western states that have the horses. Okay. Thank you, sir. I Thank guess you, Mr. Chairman. A, a, oh, we had something else here. No. Um, you suggested that there are adequate, there's adequate uh, safeguards in the Wild Horse and Burrow Act that management, when it was passed, management of these herds would be uh, taken care of. Now you're suggesting that the the BLM probably isn't as much at fault for that management as Congress itself is with by passing other. Uh, Mr. Chairman, certainly Congress by prohibiting sale of horses for okay. slaughter purposes created the problem. Now to be straightforward about it, other potential solutions have evolved since that time, such as sterilization and uh, running, managing single sex herds and things like that, uh, which would be, could be, if, if we could get down to the management numbers, I believe for one, that we could maintain those numbers using those other tools without a need to continually being in a horse slaughtering process. I'm doubtful today because the numbers are so far being exceeded and more so every year that, that we can necessarily get there with just those tools. But uh, I, I, I would be comfortable saying if, if all parties would work together and allow those other tools to be utilized, uh, horse slaughter does not necessarily have to become a permanent part of our solution to this problem. Well, thank you. I, yeah, I would say that the act itself isn't working if we've got a herd twice as big as it, it really should be. Okay, committee, yes. Representative Fortner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You stated in the law that, that horses can't be sold for profit. Is there anything in that law that says that horses can't be exchanged as a gift? They started a meat processing plant for dog food on a reservation. Is there any way in this Utah law that they got on the books that says that the state becomes the owner of those when they, when they leave the BLM? If we use that law, if we mirrored that law in Wyoming and then give those horses back to the reservation for processing, where would we stand? Thank you. 
Mr. Chairman, Representative Fortner, that, that's uh, an interesting thought as far as the reservation that might be worthy of some consideration. The, the prohibition against slaughter has another component to it that uh, USDA inspectors in these slaughter facilities, that they're prohibited from inspecting a facility that slaughters horses. So therefore, if a facility slaughters horses, they're, they're basically, they can't have USDA inspection, so they can't sell the product afterwards. So that's another way they, they get at us there. But in terms of if the horses were turned over to a, a, a tribal control, and as I believe, as I understood the comments that were offered earlier by the tribal representatives, they don't have that prohibition. Uh, but because the horses are federal property, how, how do you get that to happen? Federal government to turn them over to, to private interests. Uh, and another thought along those lines is that we've maintained for a long time, uh, understand the emotion and everything that's involved in slaughtering horses in the United States. Uh, if, if we could just take these live horses and load them on a ship and ship them to any number of foreign countries where horse meat consumption is a normal part of a diet and we're not slaughtering horses, we're, whether we're donating them or selling them to those people and then becomes their issue, that could be another answer. I, I know that doesn't, isn't acceptable to many of the groups out there, but that would be a way around doing something that's clearly unpopular and unacceptable for us to do in our country in the current climate. Uh, thank you. I, I, I think we're past the, the popular and the unpopular stage. Uh, I think I think we've well well exceeded that when we've become almost ten thousand head of horses, uh, way way beyond the threshold. Uh, I think we need to push the envelope to look at maybe shipping them out alive, like you say, you know. Bring the money back to the state of Wyoming if there's any money to be brought back. I don't know how expensive that is. Uh, you know, we got, we got we're going to have to tackle it somewhere or another. You know, right now uh, the ag community, oh, I'd just say the community of Wyoming, uh, they go after the sage grouse again, like they did back in the Obama era. They're going to make it. They're going to list it as endangered species. That's all there is to it, and that's going to come back and it's going to bite every industry. Two thirds of the ranchers, because they're sitting on federal mineral, uh, it's it's going to be devastating for Wyoming. So we need to start protecting uh, not only the grouse but the people in Wyoming as well. We need we need to get ahead of the ahead of the curve instead. Of, we've already been behind it for so many years. I guess we think we're ahead of the curve, but really we're not. Uh, but anyways, that's a good, that's an excellent suggestion. Maybe we need to be looking at creating a process to do that to move move them horses out of the United States and, and abroad. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chairman, Representative Heiner, you know, you bring back to mind, uh, we participated in a wild horse conference that was held in Cody last year. And the, uh, the then uh, acting director of the national BLM was there and, and spoke at that event. And he laid out a scenario for us by their calculations that we're, we're fast approaching 100,000 wild horses in the West. And he laid out a scenario, and I don't recall the time frame now, but it was within uh, 10 to 15 years, where without proper control, we will have a million horses on the public land in the West. Well, that, however you may feel about horses, that's the destruction of, of wildlife habitat. That's the destruction of the grazing industry in the West. It's destructive of, of all the values that all of us in a state like Wyoming so dearly appreciate. So I, I think that having an alarmist attitude is not inappropriate on this issue at this time. Thank you, sir. So to ship them out for slaughter is illegal, correct? That's correct. It's, they're prohibited. Uh, I said use the term sale because that's the way it was done in the past. It's really prohibited to dispose of the animals for slaughter. Okay. So that, that portion of it would have to be done by the US Congress, correct? I, if, I believe if, that would okay. that would have to they would have right. to have authorization from Congress to to sell those horses. All right. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you for your testimony. Now, next we have the Wild Wyoming Wild Horse Improvement Partnership, Ms. Chapman and 
miscentered. There you are. You've been here before. Welcome back. Um, thank you, uh, Co-Chairman McClendon Boner, um, <clears throat> for this opportunity to come back and speak to you. Um, Wyoming Wild Horse Improvement Partnership, we go by YWIP, is encouraged by the willingness of the state to seek um, solutions to the wild horse crisis. And I'm, I, I'd like to concur with the idea that this is indeed a crisis um, throughout the West and, and, it's, and it's here in Wyoming. Um, so it does affect uh, industries in Wyoming that are very important to us. It affects our agriculture, it affects our wildlife. It also affects tourism. Um, and it affects the wild horses. So I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to present some ideas to you today. Um, so as we mentioned in our last uh, presentation to you, we are in discussion with the Bureau of Land Management for a darting project. And we are slated um, to possibly begin that darting project in the Stewart Creek herd management area, which is just north of Rollins, about 20 miles north of Rollins, um, the beginning of next year. They did a gather, BLM did a gather of that area in 2020, and they removed down to mid AML. So that gives us a good chance to be actually effective in that area. Um, of course, the, the project itself is under the direction of the BLM and our involvement is not established through a, an MOU at this point, we are in discussion about that. Um, so I wanna make that clear that uh, any projects that we would do with the Bureau of Land Management have to be approved by the Bureau of Land, Manage Bureau of Land Management um, and they, um, it, it, it's through the process of an MOU and volunteer um, efforts from a nonprofit group. So, um, Let's see, sorry, my, I have so to look here. Before you move on the darting, mm -hmm. um, is it to sterilize the horses or to capture yes, the Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, that would be a fertility control project. So um, they did administer fertility control when they did the roundup to any of the mares that they released back out onto the uh, herd management area. They did that in the entire Red Desert complex, which consists of five herd management areas. Um, and I know, I, I believe I shouldn't, uh, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Bureau of Land Management, but I do believe that's the intention for the uh, roundup that um, the director spoke of that will be taking place in the Rock Springs area. Um, so that any, any horses that are returned to the HMAs after gather, they, they typically gather excess they administer the fertility control and they are leaning more towards the use of the control that lasts for two years. Um, so that should help a little bit. Um, I'd also like to just briefly touch on part of what our agreement with the, what we intend to uh, do in our agreement with the, the Bureau of Land Management. And that is also offer some support in other areas. And, um, you know, they've been very willing to work with us. The Rollins district has been, and we're, we're exceptionally grateful for that opportunity. So we, we have gone out um, several times over the summer with the uh, wild horse specialist from the Rollins district to um, monitor water. And as you guys know, water is very important on the desert um, for the animals and water sources are because they tend to congregate towards that resource. And so spreading out that resource of water um, prohibits the uh, over impact. I, I'm not sure what word to use, but um, it, it, it prevents degradation to one specific area. And so if the cattle or it, I mean, it, it can be cattle, sheep or horses, if they have to move around for their water throughout the day, or throughout the month um, because water sources are turned off or dried up and they have to go to another one, it prevents too much impact in one specific area. So I think that's part of uh, an important concept of range management. And I know that most of you guys are 
aware of that. So we did monitor multiple sites to make sure that there is water encouraging the horses to move about, encouraging the cattle to move about. And um, I, I think I think that's something that needs to be considered too. I know that you guys are talking about that in, in later sections, um, water issues. So um, moving on, I'd like to uh, also talk about observations of other projects. Um, they do demonstrate uh, an effectiveness, but it's not complete. So a darting is, um, Darting one HMA is not, not gonna solve this problem. Um, currently, I'd like to just sort of bring the awareness back down to the Southern border with, with Colorado. They're doing a roundup in San Juan Basin, but they did a collared study that demonstrated that the uh, horses definitely transfer between the state of Wyoming and Colorado. So you're talking about two different states um, and two different management within the BLM um, offices. So they have gone between Sandwash, or yeah, Sandwash Basin and Adobe Town Salt Wells areas. Um, Sandwash Basin had a very effective darting program, but I, my, this is just my personal opinion. Um, the reason they're doing a gather down there right now is aside from the drought, uh, there was too many new horses coming in from another HMA. And that's gonna, if they're not treated, you have more being born. Um, and, and being born down there and staying down there. Um, they did gather uh, a lot of horses off of HMA down there as well. Um, so those would be Colorado strays. Um, so it, I, I think what I'm sort of trying to uh, bring to your attention is that it's, it's a little bit incomprehensive. And if you hit and miss, um, it's not going to be effective. So encouraging the BLM or supporting maybe some of these darting projects to enable the BLM to be more successful, I think is very important in solving this problem. Um, so I'd like to just maybe propose that uh, through this process, um, if there is funding to uh, enable the state of Wyoming as a whole, perhaps to have a darting team that might uh, consist of nonprofit organizations, perhaps tribal people, um, representatives from the tribal tribal lands, maybe Wyoming Game and Fish, they expressed a, a willingness to be involved also, um, that these teams could go really implement these projects with the BLM. Um, of course, it takes a, a willingness with the Bureau of Land Management. And, uh, you know, that's, that's out of our um, scope. But having that available, I do think is, is definitely helpful. Um, so uh, one of the other things that um, came to mind as, as I was listening to other people talk is that darting teams, part of the, the, um, part of the, the whole effectiveness of the program is, is having uh, people on the ground who can identify individual horses and, um, and, and bands and, and having a good understanding of those things. If there are branded strays within some of those herds, if they're going to stand out, we're going to know. Um, we're looking for identifying markers on horses. So we're looking, I mean, we're actually looking at whorls on the face and coat patterns, um, uh, socks and, and facial markings and, and other things. So, um, you know, if there is a brand on a horse, we could maybe identify that horse and reach out to the livestock board and that would keep a handle on that situation. Um, because I do know it is, it is a concern. Um, so I'd like to just point out also that a stray dumped horses are similar to the cat and dog overpopulation situation. I think that you could uh, make the argument that um, when people are inundated with horses, it's usually because they've extended themselves somehow um, and overbreeding is, is part of that situation. I have no idea how that fits in with this, but um, you know, there perhaps could be some laws enacted that address that. Uh, it's been done for cats and dogs. Um, but uh, along those lines, the removal cost, um, my understanding and communication with the BLM is that removal cost of one horse is in excess of $1,000. That's just for the gather. That's just the hire of that contractor. 
they are paid between $800 and $1,000 per horse that enters the trap, whether it's released or not. So it starts at $1,000 per horse, roughly, and it moves on to significant cost for transportation and feed and vetting and everything else. So you can see how that would quickly add up. So um, I can't imagine that the cost effectiveness of um, the helicopter gathers versus a darting maybe contractor or something like that would be that high. Um, I, I, I just can't, can't see where it would be $1,000 to dart one horse. Um, then uh, finally, I'd like to leave you guys with um, this thought you, you discussed with the Department of Corrections, some options there. Um, my partner, Mary Santagata, who I apologize could not be here today. She's actually from Connecticut and um, she works for the uh, Connecticut Department of Agriculture. She oversees inmates who care for animals through the state of um, uh, Connecticut Department of Corrections. So, um, and, and for the animal control. So what, it's a little different than what I think you guys have been proposing in that um, these are animals that are seized in abuse cases and neglect cases. And then she's overseeing inmates who care for those animals while they are in the custody of the state. But uh, she is looking for um, options of perhaps a sanctuary situation in the, in the state of Wyoming for uh, some of the wild horses and partnering with um, other agencies to provide the care. And, you know, maybe it doesn't have to be a sanctuary situation. Maybe it can be something else um, until, they're, until they're moved on. Um, Department of Corrections did not uh, mention any prices and they may not even be aware of, um, of the prices that are being offered through the online auctions for the horses that they've trained it's in the thousands of dollars. They are, these horses are being bid up into the thousands of dollars. They're wild Mustangs that were trained by the Department of Corrections and they're being sold for thousands of dollars. I think that, you know, they need some, some recognition for that um, achievement. That's, that's incredible. Um, and it, that, that revenue is going to the uh, Bureau of Land Management. Um, of course they have, you know, their agreements, but, um, at any rate, I, I, I again would like to uh, thank you all for hearing what I had to say and uh, and for inviting us to the table. I'm, I think we are in, uh, definitely in support of this um, bill as well. Thank you. Thank you. Committee questions. Okay, I, I guess I would have maybe a couple here. Um, do you... Well, the first one's easiest. Um, <laughs> would your organization be in favor of, rather than darting, having a uh, permanent sterility of, of these horses? Because I think even if we did do that, you'd have, they, they breed yep. pretty easily. Thank you for your question, uh, Representative Eklund. Um, I, I do think that, you know, uh, it's, it's not, it's not a popular option uh, for a lot of the welfare um, advocates, but we are in a crisis and I, I don't wanna see the degradation of our rangelands at all. That is where our main focus lies, is um, keeping the rangelands healthy because the horses share that land with the wildlife and I'm very much in, in favor of uh, wildlife and the sage grouse and, our heritage is ranching, uh, whether I agree with it or not. Um, I, I was raised in a ranching family. I mean, it is part of Wyoming's heritage and it is here. And my opinion is that without the ranchers on the range too, um, some of it, these other things can suffer. Um, ranchers work very hard to provide the water for the horses as well in our state. And, you know, that's an important aspect. So yes, I, I think that at this point, at this point, things need to be done. And permanent sterilization keeps the horses on the range. So yeah, I think we would be open to that. They'd be your, your organization. Uh, yes, would, YWIP, would, yes. And you'd be in favor of, therefore, a smaller herd 
and because we talked about health of the rangeland right did not you didn't mention health of the horse herd itself because if they run out of food they'll winter kill just like other animals exactly and and we do want to see healthy herds um i think that the uh appropriate management levels are um fairly accurate for today's standards um i think that there could be room for those to change in the future, but I would I would not like to see them go smaller. Um, and that is because of uh, research that's been done on genetic viability. If you have a herd of less than um, a certain number, you really start encroaching on genetic viability um, of those herds. And I think that the herds should, I mean, they have their place there through the Horse and Wild Horse and Burrow Act. So I think they, they do belong. Um, on BLM lands, the, that we're not here to really discuss that as much as when they go beyond those things. Um, you don't see them spreading out looking for resources when the numbers are where they need to be. Well, so, think, would you agree that the the management of the herd could include the genetic diversity that yeah. that's necessary? Okay. Yes, absolutely. Um, the other question is, and it would probably be limited. I don't think you can give me an idea nationally what the mindset is. I can imagine what it is, but in our Wyoming Wild Horse Improvement Association, would they be in favor of, of uh, allowing the slaughter of these horses to get the numbers down to a reasonable US management? It's thousand dollars to collect the horse and, right. and easily got to be a couple thousand to keep it for a year. Right. Um, you know, the numbers are astounding. I'm not going to disagree with that. Uh, however, I do, I, I will say that we are not in support of slaughter. I think there are better options out there. Um, I, I truly feel like we have better options in front of us and we've proven the worth of these horses in the right situation. And I think that when you consider the BLM wanting to gather 4,000 horses, placement of 4,000 horses is really not, not a big deal, not, not in the world that I've seen. So um, now the, the numbers on the Wind River Reservation, that's, that's a different story. But again, I feel like we can do better, so. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. So the, the next on our agenda are the, uh, Business Council for the Shoshone and the Arapaho did, and I don't, are they on, on the Mr. Internet? Chairman, I do not think that they are on okay. Zoom. Well, I and I, it, it very well may be that they um, passed the torch to our very first testifiers yeah. that, that, um, in this topic earlier today. Okay, I'm getting a nod from those gentlemen. Thank you. Okay. Office of the State Lands and Investments, come on up. Well, go ahead and state your names and welcome to our committee. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Jennifer Scoggin. I'm the director for the Office of State Lands and Investments. With me today is Deputy Director Jason Crowder, and we actually have Holly Dyer, our Assistant Director for our Trust Land um, Division in the audience today. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak on this wild horse issue. Uh, we are relatively new to the discussion. Uh, we did see a copy of the bill, I think it was late last week, and realized that uh, we were involved and had not provided any information to the committee. So today we did um, distribute to the committee, or at least I think we did, um, some maps and some information related to state lands and sort of how they are impacted in the herd management areas. And so first I would um, yield the floor to Deputy Crowder to go over that information with you. And then uh, Mr. Chairman at your discretion, we have some comments on the bill. And if you wanna take them right after, or if you wanna wait until you discuss the bill, we're at your disposal. So thank you. Okay. Just go ahead and proceed, Mr. Okay. Crowder, thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, for the committee, this is the report that we're referencing. It was provided in hard copy today, so I don't think it was part of your LSO packet. But uh, as the original concept of the bill was discussed in the last meeting, that is how we developed the numbers that I wanna talk about today. It has nothing to do with private land, has nothing to do with county owned land. Those are uh, GIS ownership layers that are a bit tricky to manage. So we didn't have, simply didn't have the time to put those together. But obviously we know the amount of state land within each one of these uh, wild horse management areas. And that's what we provided to you on the first page is each one of the wild horse management areas that the BLM manages, the amount of state, state acreage that's involved in each one of those. Um, per the BLM's numbers, uh, the AML level at the low and the high, and the amount of estimated horses that they uh, represent on their website in each one of those areas. As the concept of the bill indicates, uh, we also put in a cost per AUM um, for those animals on state trust land at the varying rates, both at the high AML and then the excess of over AML. Our AUM fee this year or next year, I apologize for 2022 is $5.24 per AUM. So we utilize that rate. It was a little unclear to us um, uh, exactly how we should utilize that rate. So we provided the committee with two scenarios, one with a six month version and one with a full year version. We understand that horses move on and off of our lands. And so we weren't sure if we were charging for the full year when the horses may not have been there for the full year, but we provided that to the committee. Um, so generally we wanted to provide you with just a high level um, bit of information that would indicate uh, based on the amount of state lands within each one of those herd management areas and based on 100% utilization by horses of the AUMs on those parcels um, for the six month period. Uh, we would be roughly at $97,000. That would be what we would provide to the BLM or for the full year, uh, $662,000. It's also important to note, I did the quick math this morning and we didn't put it on this spreadsheet, but we can. The percentage of state land um, for all of these herd management areas, all of these herd management areas total over 4.7 million acres. Our state land involvement is 153,103 acres and that's just 3.2% of all of the herd management areas within the state. Mr. Chairman, following that spreadsheet are just some maps to give you a further indication on where these herd management sit across the state, um, how our state trust land are involved within them, and a general indication of how private land might be involved within them. But again, uh, that's more analysis that we would need to do. Mr. Chairman, that's the information we provided today. I'm happy to answer any questions. Committee, questions for for state lands. Yes, go ahead, Representative Clausen. So maybe you went over it and I missed it, but that, how did you, you figured you, the AUM used off of current uses, horse uses, and then I assume currently these are all leased to, uh, to grazing leases for livestock as well. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Clausen, we had to use a generalization to reach these numbers. Uh, we didn't go into each and every single parcel. I'm not gonna be able to say that each and every parcel has a grazing lease. Uh, a few of these may be vacant for various reasons, but I, I'm gonna venture probably 98% of them do. And then we also generalize the AUMs based on the areas that these herd management areas are, are in. So generally we have uh, about eight acres per AUM in these areas and, and we use that figure to start with our calculation and then multiply that by 1.25 for the horse conversion and then our state grazing fee. Representative Heiner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, you may have went over this as well, but I, I missed it. Uh, the three times state rate for a, AUM, what's the justification for three times state rate? Mr. Chairman, Representative, that came from the legislation um, that the numbers over uh, the expected high AML numbers, the difference between high, ML, high AML and the existing numbers of horses within these areas is in excess. And those were the, the amount of horses times 1.25 times three that we reached that full number. But the three times was uh, given to us in the statute or in the draft bill. Follow up, Go ahead. Mr. Chairman. So 1.25, is that the amount that a horse consumes as comparison to a, a, a cow? Mr. Chairman. As, I've, I've heard different numbers. Is that what number you're using? Mr. Chairman, that's correct.
other questions? Yes, go ahead, go chairman. So it looks like you've already kind of crunched these numbers here. So I'm assuming you don't need the appropriation that's a placeholder in the bill, is that correct? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chair, these numbers are relatively easy to crunch. They're not validated in any sense, they're generalized. So if you would like validated numbers and specifically validated numbers on private land, we certainly need uh, more resources than we currently have. Okay. And I, I guess just that from your perspective, dealing with this on the Sonda as your job is the methodology that's very specific in statute, is it adequate in your opinion? Mr. Chairman, I, I think so. Yes. Representative Clausen. Um, Mr. Chairman, Deputy Director. So uh, if you take out the, the leases that, that are, of course aren't, aren't uh, effective at the moment, but uh, those other leases are currently being uh, used by, I assume, grazers and they're pay, paying those leases. Is there a, was there a factor in the, in the billing that, that building the BLM for those state leases and then turning around and uh, the, the private leasee is also paying those those leases in some sort of a factor considered that uh, they're being deprived of something that they're paying for. Mr. Chairman, Representative, that was not factored into these numbers. Um, this is generally what the private grazers on our state lands are paying us for those AUMs. This is essentially just doubling. Uh, what we have as far as revenue off of these properties. One set of AUMs going to the, the lessees and the other set going to the wild horse uses, uses. All right. Yes, Representative Heiner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Deputy Director, you're, you're a wealth of information and I appreciate your willingness to share this. So we, we use a factor of one for a cow, 1.25 for a, a a horse, but we know there's other competing factors out there as well. And I'm thinking of elk. Do you, uh, do you, and sheep? So, do you have a factor for for elk that are using that are consuming our forage as well as sheep? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative, there are industry standards for those factors to be placed on AUMs. Um, the AUM is derived from a cow calf pair, an 800 generally 800 pound cow with a calf um, and how much forage they need to survive for the year and be productive and, and beneficial. Uh, for a sheep, that conversion is five times the rate. We don't have in our office anyway, um, a conversion for an elk. However, when we derive these AUMs, when we actually do what we call the field sheets and the field assessment of how much forage is available for use um, by those grazers, we can reduce that number by the amount of wildlife impact to the ground. Um, and it's not any anything that has to do with a 1.25 or a five, it's a general number based on uh, general, a lot of generalities, I guess. Um, but we can reduce uh, those AUM numbers. And if the field inspector, when we initially derived these assessments, uh, felt that there was heavy elk pressure or other wildlife, he had the opportunity, they had the opportunity to reduce that AUM number to account for the wildlife that's currently utilizing that forage. So do you have a general number for an elk forage uh, as, as comparison to the AUM? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't have that specific number, but I can tell you how, not off the top of my head, but I can provide that information, how much we would have reduced based on heavy elk pressure on a specific piece of ground. Thank you for your time. Oh, we've got more. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That sparked another question. So do you reduce AUMs to the lease based on heavy uh, wild horse or feral horse pressure as well? Mr. Chairman, Representative Clausen, without looking at each and every individual lease, I can't say that we have. Um, my experience tells me that we really haven't, uh, but we would need to go back and look at every lease. A lot of these leases that we're talking about in the desert area don't get inspected all that often. In fact, probably 1970s was the most recent. And so depending on horse pressure at that time, that would be what the assessment was based off of. So the management of that land is dependent on the leasee. Mr. Chairman, sorry. And if the horses are eating more forage than 
and their lease he'd be used to, he would be reducing his cattle or sheep numbers or his own horse numbers. Uh, Mr. Chairman, again, that's taken on a case by case basis, sure. depending on the complaints of our lessee, and we would uh, assess this appropriately. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Oh, go Mr. Ahead. Chairman, we did have a couple of comments on the draft okay. bill if you wanted us to yes. present that at this point. Yep, we, this would be a good time to do that. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I believe uh, Mr. McGagna stole some of our thunder. He, he raised quite a few of the issues. Um, to the extent that private claims are involved, obviously our concern is, as Mr. McGagna talked about, is this really within the mission of state lands? But should this body determine that it is, um, as you might imagine, we think we'd need to hire additional staff. Um, there would be impacts to our field services folks, our trust land folks, and our administrative services division with respect to processing um, the claims and the collections and deposits. These are already busy programs that we've cut to the bone um, with the recent um, uh, revenue issues. Um, and again, the number of staff would depend upon the popularity of this program. Um, it's unclear to us if, in fact, ARPA funds were used, if the idea would be this would just be a temporary program, and if so, sort of what happens after that. Um, and Mr. McGagna sort of raised this claim too, or this um, point too, is, is the idea, and maybe I'm sort of coming up with issues before they are issues, but if, in fact, OSLI would just be sort of a clearinghouse for these private claims or whether there would be an expectation that we would kind of drill down into them and verify them in some way, obviously that would impact our budgets and our staffing and that sort of thing. Um, and Mr. McGagna is right. In some instances, the private landowners may be in the best position to um, make their claims and what would happen in the event that a private landowner um, disputed or didn't agree with whatever verification or um, uh, claim uh, amount it is that OSLI would come up with and what would those standards of proof be and would we need the Board of Land Commissioners to pass on them before we presented them um, to the federal government. Um, the other thing too, importantly, um, Mr. McGagna raised that was concerning to us is that the draft legislation does not um, account for reimbursing the, the board or the state trust beneficiaries for impacts to state trust lands. Um, the legislation provides that a private owner can seek their proportionate share of monies recovered and a year after um, that period the funds would be credited to the county where the lands are located and the balance to the general fund, but there's no provision for the board to recover monies related to damages for state lands. And so with that, those are our initial thoughts and concerns, and we appreciate um, the ability to raise those today. Okay. So with those statements, do you think the state lands is the appropriate agency to be handling these claims? Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't know. That's a good question without impacts to our staffing and whatnot, but I, I agree with Mr. Um, McGagna that perhaps on the, the private side, um, that should be left to them. However, perhaps the Department of Ag or somebody else is in a better position to push forward those claims, but whatever this body would decide, obviously we would be happy to help with. I don't know if the Department of Ag was ready to comment on any of that, but I would invite them up if they are late, later on here, as soon as we're done with you. Um, but the attorney general is an appropriate place for the private owners to send their claims. Would that be your guess? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't know about that. Um, okay. I think if in fact, and I, I'm not providing legal advice to this body by any stretch, but I think the attorney general would have to weigh in on that, but I, I don't know the, um, their comfortable, um, their ability to be comfortable with that either. Committee, it looks like we're done and thank you for your comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And your help with this, this complex issue. So the, the next thing we're gonna do is have some public comment. Um, is, does it, is the Department of Ag able to comment on this at all? You guys thought, of, okay, you're not in it, so. We might have more information from you later on. Be thinking about that. Thank you. 
uh, are there members of the public that would like to comment on this bill before we take it up for discussion? Mr. Moline, welcome to the committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Brett Moline, Wyoming Farm Bureau Federation. Uh, sitting in support of this bill, I think it's something that's been long overdue for all the reasons that have been stated before. So I will attempt to be brief. I know I'm not very good at it, but with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd sit for any questions. Questions? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any other public comment? All right, we'll close this to public comment committee. What's your pleasure? Oh, we got another one. Come on up. Very briefly, Keith Kennedy on behalf of the Association of Conservation Districts, and we too support this. I think one thing that you really do need to consider with this on the private side is that this is a somewhat standardized practice. Uh, form, what have you, as to how this happens, because otherwise it's going to be almost impossible if this ever gets to a point where the attorney general is involved. Uh, in other words, there needs to be some way to aggregate this. And I'd also suggest that uh, you might provide means to aggregate that private data so that there's no uh, means. And I realize that, of course, there is a very big player in this involved, but those smaller operators also need to be protected so that there's no retaliation takes place in any other way too. So with that, I'd welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have any anybody online? Not missing anyone else then. Okay. All right. Now we'll close it. And uh, committee, what's your pleasure? Move the bill. It moved by Clausen, seconded by by uh, co-chairman Boner. Okay, discussion. Yeah, maybe maybe we <clears throat> we'll work on the amendments after. Okay. All right, let's just go ahead and discuss the bill. Go go through it. And Mr. We'll Chairman, if that's on, your pleasure, I'm happy. Suggestion. I'm prepared to go through the bill draft if you wish. Thank, thank you, Heather. Go ahead. Okay, Mr. Chairman. This is just to walk through bill draft 22 LSO-0050 version six, working working draft 0 0.6. The committee has heard much of what the bill already does through several of the people who have commented. I'll point out the places where it does those various things that people had, had mentioned. So the several things that this bill draft does, if you look at page one on the title, is it does require notice to federal land management agencies uh, of the cost of wild horse grazing on state and private lands Author, it authorizes the enforcement by writ of mandamus for removal of wild horses from non-federal lands. And it provides for state management of wild horses and burrows with the tribes and federal land management agencies and provides some definitions and appropriations. So if we move into it. Heather, and, Heather yes, could Mr. you Chairman. maybe before we go on, um, a brief explanation of writ of mandamus Yes, Mr. Chairman, a writ of mandamus, and th this is important because I think, I don't mean to put anything into the committee's minds or anything, but I think there may have been some misunderstanding of what a writ of mandamus does. Typically, a writ of mandamus is something to compel a, um, a, a, an actor to do a, partic a particular action that they are required to do. So there was some discussion that the writ would require them to pay these notices of costs and that wouldn't be the case. The, a, a federal person is mandated to do what's in the, for, this is for example and applicable to this act, a federal actor would be required to um, fulfill its 
um, what, what is required to do uh, from the, uh, the federal Wild Horse and Burrow Act, which is to manage or remove horses from, um, from federal lands. So a writ of mandamus, if, if, a, if the Wyoming Act Attorney General, for example, uh, applied for one and, was, and if it was granted, would then tell that, for example, the secretary of the BLM or the secretary of the, Wild, the Forest Service, go do this thing that you're supposed to do. It would not say, hey, go do that thing that that Wyoming legislation told you to do because that can't, you can't cross over like that. You can't tell a federal actor to do something that state said they should do. Which is also part of why there's the tone in this bill that these are notices of costs that would be presented to the federal government. But that it, it says, you know, if by some chance that something were to come from it, <laughs> some money were to actually come back from that, then this is what, how it would be addressed and where the money would go. But it's not saying like with a big expectation that that would actually happen. Okay, committee, I hope that's helpful. Um, any questions for our attorney before we move on concerning the writ of mandamus? Yes, go ahead, Senator Bouchard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was looking at an article in August of this year, and it says the BLM is looking at using a four to five year uh, vaccine that sterilizes the horses and also other roundup things. So, I mean, I just, it, I'm looking at this bill and I'm looking, and then I look at all this as a moving target right now. Have we seen the latest directives? So we even know because that's, I'm not hearing the same directives that I'm reading about here. And that's where I'm kind of lost here because I, if we're gonna talk about a writ of mandatus, we should be knowing what that moving target is Mr. and maybe put it in the bill. Anyway, thank you. Mr. Chairman, Senator Bouchard, I think it's true. There is a lot of focus on this topic at the moment. And I think that there are many efforts I, I don't know that there's this bill does not address sterilization does not at this point address sterilization as one of those management efforts. However, I we we've just heard from some even the the person before me or the people a couple before me. So, I I think it very much is this bill um, or an additional companion bill might address some other efforts. Okay, thank you. Are we good? All right, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but oh, we got another. Go ahead, Representative Fortner. Thank you, Chairman. So let me get this right. I, I guess I missed it. This is this is coming out of CARES funding, and it's only a one-time shot. And then after that, the taxpayers picks up the tab for the remaining years. Is that right? Mr. Chairman, okay. it may be helpful to go through the bill at this time. I don't yeah. think that that is the entirety of the understanding that is intended. We're still on. I think there's more if we go through the bill that may become clear. Okay. Yeah, let's, let's continue on with okay. the bill, maybe. But okay. So moving on to page two, um, and this addresses some of that most recent question immediately is this would put into statute. So this uh, an ongoing um, effort there. This goes into Title 11 is a lot, are a lot of the agriculture related statutes, but it, um, it goes into the section that already prohibits the unlawful killing of wild horses, but it, it expands that and it creates a definition or with a section that we're, is about to do that I will just to foreshadow it, it tells this is the part that requires the Office of State Lands and Investments to basically to keep track of the costs of the wild horse foraging and then to send a notice of costs to the uh, federal government. So to accomplish that in subsection A, it, it, um, this bill adds some um, definitions and it was pointed out by previous folks who were sitting here and, and on the Zoom that um, the inclusion of private landowners is in fact challenging. So this, that was the committee's directive from the May meeting, but it certainly is um, challenging to include them for many of the reasons that different folks have brought up. Um, but so here we go in the affected non-federal lands right there in the definition, it means state, county or private lands upon which the landowner has proof that wild horses have, reg have regularly grazed. Um, 
And then it also adds the definition of appropriate management level or AML. And those are some of the numbers that you, you just saw some uh, delineated out and that the BLM also spoke about, which is just the number of wild horses that the either BLM or US Forest Service um, have determined can exist sustainably on a portion of land. And also the number at which those um, or the range of numbers, you know, from low to high of at which those organizations are supposed to maintain them on the on the um, federal lands. A herd management area going on to page three is a land uh, means lands that are under the supervision of the BLM or the Forest Service for um, upon which wild horse populations are managed. It has been suggested that perhaps there are, people have said, um, state lands that are part of HMAs, the herd management areas. It appears from the actual legal def definitions that an HMA is the federal land. And so this is, that's why the, um, you'll see as we keep going that there's, it talks about lands adjacent to it or connected to it in order to calculate the lands that are affected. Um, so we move into subsection, a new subsection C, and this is where, this is the part that says that if uh, upon the refusal or failure of one of these um, agencies, the BLM or Forest Service, to remove some uh, the wild horses as they are supposed to do from, um, from as, sorry, as required, the the, if these horses regularly stray from federal lands, the Office of State Lands shall provide the federal government with this notice of costs as um, to, and then, then this goes on at the very bottom, you see at page, or starting at line 21, that to facilitate the calculation of these costs, we then create a mechanism. And this isn't some magic mechanism, this is just to try to put into some sort of a statute um, what the committee had discussed from um, the Wyoming Stock Growers Association materials, actually. So moving on to the top of page four, first, what they need to do, and, they, and they've actually even done this in a very general matter, manner in the materials that the Office of State Lands and Investments provided, determine the, the total area of the herd management area plus the adjacent affected non-federal lands. So what is this, you know, what is the area we're talking about? And then um, for state and county, state and county lands. So see, these are the public lands. So these are the ones that are under the control of the state or county. Determine the percentage of the total area that consists of the state and county lands of that total. So there's the H the HMA, the herd management area, plus the um, non affected or the affected non federal lands. And then what percentage of that is county or state lands? And then because of the, man, the requirement that this committee said to include private lands, this, this subparagraph B describes a mechanism that seems like it may work, however, has been pointed out, could be problematic because it's private. Um, and that is for private lands that if a private landowner wants to be you know, included in this calculation, you know, so that they would have written, had done a written application to the OSLI, um, then they would the the we could would be able to figure out what the percentage of those private lands were as a part of this total that is given in an amount to the federal government for how much the they were affected. Um, the, there is the paragraph starting or the sentence starting at line fifteen on page four that just because this is calculated as uh, uh, private lands are calculated as part of the whole, it does not constitute some liability on the part of the state that this is even gonna be collected or anything like that. It's just trying to get an accurate calculation as part of the whole. Then paragraph two starts at the bottom of page four, and that's using the annual wild horse data from the Bureau of Land Management or Forest Service to, they would calculate the animal, um, animal unit month amount of forage consumed by the wild horses. And again, this was on that chart on the second page of that BL, of the OSLI materials. I mean, a, a rough idea they, they were trying to, they were trying to anticipate or trying to work at how this mechanism in, in the draft bill would work. And then they would take, they would, in paragraph three, they multiply this forage consumed as calculated by under paragraph two, by the percentage of the state, county or private lands that was determined back in paragraph one to come up with 
um, an amount and uh, of the for this notice of costs that it would be created to give to the federal government. And it would be for um, wild horse numbers that are up to the appropriate management levels, the high, you know, with, within the appropriate management levels, then it would be equal to the land lease rate per animal unit month for Wyoming trust land grazing leases. I inserted trust land in my copy just because it seemed like we had that reference incorrect. Um, and Mr. McAgna pointed that out. Um, but that for in wild horse numbers, that are in excess of the highest amount that is said to be the capacity for wild horse numbers, that it would be three times the land lease rate. And um, again, three times is not a magic number. That's just what was in the recommendation to put in the bill. That could be some other amount. Um, then, so that then this is this is sent to the federal government. But sub or subsection D at the bottom of page five accounts for the possibility that any reimbursement monies would actually come <laughs> as a result of these notice of costs. And if they do come in, where would they go? So this creates that um, the, if the monies come in that they would um, the they would be, be deposited with the state treasurer. And here's the complication of if there were private funds within there, how would the private landowners get some of them? So it does create some sort of a mechanism. But again, if this is all taken, if the private landowners stuff is taken out of it, that dramatically um, let, uncomplicates this little mechanism here. Um, and then uh, so then whatever land is for the state or state or county, you know, the other public land that would go into some account, which it has been pointed out should probably not be the general fund. It should probably go into the permanent land fund or to some fund destined, destined for education purposes or the purposes for those state trust lands, which is at the bot on line 16 on page six, saying of where that money finally ultimately goes, <laughs> if any were to come in. Um, then at the bottom of page six, there's subsection E. And this is, this is, okay, so the, the first part of the bill we talked about, that's the notice of costs that's sent to the federal government, completely separate, but also part of this bill as one of the overall scheme of looking, of addressing some wild horse, um, some um, resolutions is to say that the state attorney general may seek a writ of mandamus to compel the United States Bureau of Land Management or Forest Service to take action to remove the horses as they're already required to do under federal law. Now, there are two things about this. This subsection E, the, a, the Attorney General can already do this, but there are other instances. Instead, what I mean by that is the Attorney General has the power to seek any um, to seek any remedy that seems appropriate, but. As Representative Winter pointed out, sometimes calling their attention to it, like, like the notice of costs will call the, fe the federal government attention to some of the costs that they're producing, whether or not they actually pay something. Well, this one also would call the AG's attention to doing a writ of mandamus. And there are instances in statute where, with uh, probably at least, I should have counted the number, but at least seven to 10 other instances in statute where it has specified, even though they already can, that. Um, that a writ of mandate, that, that some, el some aspect of the statutes is enforceable by writ of mandamus. So it's not unprecedented, unprecedented to put it in like this. And so this is just saying that they shall seek one, doesn't mean they will be granted one by a federal court, but they shall seek a writ of mandamus to compel the um, federal government to do as they are supposed to be doing. Um, this idea that the 10% on page seven of uh, is that they can include in the whole picture of how many lands are being affected, 10%, that, that wasn't some magic number. If it needs to be a majority or if private land needs to come out of it entirely, that would be the committee's 10% uh, was really just a number <laughs> that I uh, put in there. It's not magic. It could be whatever the committee decided. Probably shouldn't be more than a majority, you know, more than half, but if, if you want it to remain in there or it could come out entirely. And then subsection F, so that, that's the writ of mandamus section. Another management tool here is in subsection F. And this is just the authorization for the governor to enter into cooperative agreements with any relevant parties, including the BLM or the Forest Service or the Eastern Shoshone tribe or the Northern Arapaho tribe or both tribes. One thing that is missing um, 
for no particular reason, but um, it occurred to me now is it, it says uh, that they can enter into any into cooperative agreements with any relevant parties. It may want to specify including private entities as the um, honor um, honor farm pointed out that and, and the section of statute that the honor farms program is in even is uh, talks about private public private um, partnerships so that may want the word private in there. Section two in the middle of page seven begins the appropriations and the there are two appropriations anticipated in this bill and the first is one to the office of state lands and investments for the purposes of implementing basically that first part of this act those notices of costs that is the part where they were addressed and then subsection b on page eight is the appropriation for to the governor for state endeavors to manage wild horses as far as whether they're going to do some sort of cooperative agreements with public or private um, agencies and then um, at the bottom of page eight begins a lengthy comment a lengthy, lengthy staff comment to just explain there some the committee had discussed in may um hey let's designate arpa funds for this and the fact is that arpa funds may only be used for the purposes that are specified in um the federal appropriation but one of them is um to uh to well, they're actually listed at the top of page nine. Um, and the, if you look at number number three on line four at the top of page nine, one that I think the committee may have been addressing was for the provision of government services to the extent of the reduction in revenue. And it's just that it gets quite problematic to necessarily designate things in this way. And, and ARPA funds, my understanding and the treasury guidance is that, um, that designating it for something that is not necessarily a specific purpose is is problematic so having it be so doing the appropriations the way it is described in the bill in section two where it's the the appropriations are from the general fund and they may not be ongoing they may be a temporary program um that 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 is the appropriate way to do it because our arpa funds are, are probably problematic they may be filling in somewhere else that maybe might free up general funds for this but it not but it's not a, a just an equal trade or anything so that's why you note that those that those appropriations on the previous pages did not say from arpa funds here's this this designation um it may be that the committee wants something um to some something like the paragraph at the bottom of page nine but it's my understanding from fiscal folks at lso that that's not wouldn't be required if if to to be um, needed and then finally on page 10 is the section three and that's the effective date which it seemed like there are so many different um, aspects of coordination and um, and different types of management that, to be addressed that and, and the urgency that folks have been saying it seemed like an, an immediate effective date was appropriate but it didn't that doesn't also have to be immediate or not that's the bill thank you, chairman okay thank you mr chairman uh, just a little bit more discussion on the uh, general funds and, and you mentioned brief i just want to make sure everybody understands that we are currently, it's my understanding, uh, supplanting basically general funds and say Department of Corrections tunes of, I mean, it's my understanding hundreds of millions of dollars. So the effect of that committee, and correct me if I'm wrong, is gonna be, we're gonna have some extra general fund dollars, one-time funds, it's really important to understand that, you know, we can't have an ongoing appropriation. I think with, uh, this bill it has to be things that are going to be one time and produce benefit over time. Um, and so uh, I just want to make sure I understand that correctly, that there's going to, we are, the state is temporarily flush with cash as a result of, um, of uh, federal action. And it's it, on the level of the uh, appropriation we got from the federal government uh, through the American Rescue Plan. Is that correct? Mr. Chairman. Committee, the state is temporary, temporarily flush with funds, um, thanks to federal action as well as state action. So it is not 
a even a certainty and ought not be in the word in the wording that um that this would be directly or, or you know that these funds would be freed up from arpa funds they could be from some there's been some positive investments that the state has had and there have been uh, some returns some mineral returns and different there's many there there are several things attributing to the fact that there may be some um some funds and it's not an uh, it's not it, it's quite a customary thing to include in an appropriation if you look on page eight starting at line 15 and on page seven nope yes page seven starting at line 22 it is quite customary to include the line that it is in the intent of the legislature that this appropriation not be included in the whichever committee or sorry whichever agency's standard budget for the immediately succeeding fiscal biennium that obviously does include some challenges if if these maybe these um uh, well, just things if they were wanting to be continued and they are being put in statute, they you know may need some sort of mechanism to carry them on in the future. But as it stands now, it's one time appropriation that's in the bill, so we're covered there. So it's not we're not permanently growing the size of government. Mr. Chairman, absolutely. Okay. Or absolutely not, whichever. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so committee, do we have suggestions for amendments? I guess we'll go there. Go ahead, co-chairman. Well, Mr. Okay. Chairman, uh, yeah. I, I have several in committee, what I, where I'm thinking around, I'm of course interested in what everybody else thinks too, but uh, we have to, I think, heavily amend this bill and to the point where I think it may be best to discuss amendments and if it's the will of the committee, maybe uh, uh, you know push it to the next meeting. Uh, Cause I, I think it does need some work. We need uh, based off public input. And frankly, I think that the part where we're talking about entering into agreements with other agencies needs a lot of work, a lot of side boards. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at. Um, and so it's a good starting point. It's good to get something. So people have, we have something to discuss, but uh, i got to propose several amendments if that's okay, Mr. Chairman. Um, it, but yeah. maybe, I, you know, I'll, I'll wait and see what the committee thinks. So it, we'll, we'll see if it, the committee has yeah. any discussion. Let's, let's have a little more discussion before it goes into this. Thank you, December. Chairman. Hang uh, on, hang on a minute, Bill. I saw Senator Bouchard first. Go ahead, and then I'll get to you. Okay. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I just want to look at the 30,000 foot view here for a minute. So we, we've got this all started in 1971 because people didn't like horse slaughtering horses. And here we are this many years later with the federal government telling us what we're gonna do here in Wyoming. We have states that have said, we don't care what you say federal government. And they, they enact all kinds of marijuana advancements and the federal government does nothing because Quite frankly, what are they going to do? And here we are skirting around all this. Okay, that's that's the front of this. We should be able to start doing what we want to do here in Wyoming. And what's really troubling in this bill to me is on, on page five, uh, line 19, any reimbursement monies received from federal land. Anyway, just let me just say the federal government. And then fast forward to page seven on line seven. And basically it says the governor is authorized to enter into, into agreements. And, you know, 1990s, and I, I talk about this all the time in health and labor, because that's how we get stuck. So when we start entering into agreements and taking money from the federal government, we take the strings that are attached. And, and it's clearly, we can see that the agenda is from the federal government is they don't want to lighten up on this and they want to keep that program going. And, and when we talk, even when we talk about sterilization, they say, well, you know, it's such a rural operation to get this done. And they're always moving to keep the status quo. So I'm really concerned here with this bill that all we're doing is keeping the status quo. We need to go firmer than what we're doing here. And we need to say, we need to fix the problem and push it at them and not say, we're going to take money 
that you could have more strings attached to. And we're in this another 20 years because, and, and here's, the, here's the danger, Mr. Chairman, is that we have one governor that could get another governor stuck in an agreement that he can't get out of. And that's a real concern here because that's how the feds play with us. They make, they coheres us with money and then we get stuck in another program. So that's my concern about this bill. I mean, that's, that's so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Representative Fortner. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> I, I gotta agree with the Senator. Uh, I think we're going too deep into the federal government. We have in the past and it's just been nothing but tie our hands. Uh, I think we possibly need to be looking at the things that, that we know that works and that's the honor farm process. I think we need to try to build on that, whether it's find other states that have the same program that would take more of our horses, uh, go that route rather than tie ourselves more to the federal government. I, I appreciate everything LSO does for us. I mean, we couldn't run without them. Everybody knows that. Uh, th this bill's just not for me. I, I'd, ha I'd have to vote no on the way it sits right now. Thank you. Well, then let's get to amending. <laughs> Go ahead, Co-Chairman. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I'd like to say, I think it definitely needs some work and certainly you know, any committee member, we can make a motion to have a, another bill draft. There's another way of going about doing this for our uh, next meeting next month. So that's uh, all on the table after I suggest we focus on this bill uh, first, then we can entertain any other uh, you know motions to get a, another type of bill draft going for our meeting next month. So that being said, Mr. Chairman, uh, I move that we uh, remove any references to uh, private property, as was discussed, um, especially OSLI's uh, involvement with that, uh, exception being paragraph E on page six, where it uh, says that a, a private party may, um, let's see, uh, well, paragraph E, that's uh, page six, line 18, so we'll basically keep uh, paragraph E, because that doesn't deal with uh, private parties with state lands, it deals with the attorney general. But if we're based, the conceptual amendment, like I said, it's pre-conceptual, um, would be to remove the private uh, property and uh, private owners involved with state lands and investments in this bill. Um, and also delete the appropriation on page seven, line 16, the Office of State Lands and Investments. So that's the first one, Mr. Chairman. Okay. So did, uh, yeah, we're also ahead. deleting the appropriation for state lands and investments on page seven, the bottom of page seven. Okay. So it's been moved and, and seconded that we remove all reference to private property. There was one exception in there and I didn't catch the It's line. just in with the AG. Okay. Um, so the, the private a property AG. associated with the uh, Office All of State right. Lands and Investments. So the AG can continue to do that. And then the other part was that the appropriation to the Office of State Lands would be removed. That's the motion discussion. Question. All question. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay. That that conceptual amendment has been uh, passed. Other, other amendments? Mr. Chairman? Yes, continue on. Okay, so Mr. Chairman, on the end of page five, when it talks about where we deposit the funds, I move that we change um, that to the Permanent Merrill Trust Fund. Everybody clear on that motion? Has it been seconded? Seconded. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. Did you say permanent land fund? Permanent mineral trust. Oh, permanent mineral. So, okay. Or I guess we can have that discussion with our yeah, appropriations. I think, or I guess it'd probably go to the common school permanent land yes. funds. That's, okay. that's my amendment. Would that be yeah. your amendment? Yeah. Yes, All that's, right. Good. that's my amendment. Amendment. Yeah. We'll have fewer arguments about that's it. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So that would... That would basically go to the funding of the school system into the permanent fund. Yes. Okay. Not not. All right. One time. Yeah. 
everyone clear on that amendment? Discussion, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay, I'm not sure. Let's have a show of hands. All those in favor of the amendment, which would put it into the, uh, what's it called then? The common council. School fund account. Mr. Chairman, I need to double check the actual name. We've been at least colloquially calling it the permanent land fund. Is and there are two, however. I I will find out the correct, correct terminology, but I think I understand that we're supposed to, we have intended it to go. Yeah. Yeah, it's permanent land fund for schools. I believe it's okay. called school permanent land fund. So in other Mr. words, Chairman. you have a choice. I'm not sure it's somebody. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I think that was Representative Western. Oh, okay. Representative Western, we haven't heard from you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. I think you're talking about the CSPLF, the Common School Permanent Land Fund. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and that, that'll be the motion. <laughs> and, and we have a choice between putting the money directly into the the school fund, or we have, or we can put it into what will amount to the general fund, I think. Correct? Yeah. Well, the current okay. bill says it will create a separate account, so. Does it really? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Everybody clear on it? It would be a separate account, or it would be the, the account we already have. All those in favor of the, the motion, put it in the commons with the schools <laughs> huh common school permanent land fund we have so many funds that <laughs> it's hard to keep track of say aye aye opposed no no i believe that passes so let's we had a few few other suggestions i think Got written down. Uh, I do, Mr. Chairman. This one is going to be uh, conceptual as well, uh, talking about page seven, line seven, talking about the cooperative agreements. And uh, first part is that I move we include private parties with corresponding amendments uh, throughout the bill and um, just have a begin a list of what is authorized, of the types of activities that are authorized under these agreements. And for now, I, we can include permanent fertility control, increasing horse programs at Department of Corrections. It will be, so we're putting that in section F on page seven. Yeah, so I, I'm just managing. Inserting it. Where would you like to put it in? This, like I said, it's a conceptual amendment. So at, just at the, like at, after line 12, we're, we're just adding on to the paragraph. So this be, you know, it, we'll have it in writing for the next meeting, represent. So that, that's like I said, we'll, we're getting the idea down and uh, seeing we can move forward. So like I said, uh, we're just going to start a laundry list of including uh, permanent fertility control, increasing horse programs in the Department of Corrections. Um, and anything else the committee wants to add? But I think it's important, Mr. Chairman. So that's the motion. And as far as the uh, justification, I think it's important that we ensure that these are one-time funds that do produce a long-term benefit because uh, you know these aren't going to be permanent programs. So that's why it's permanent fertility control. That's why it's uh, getting additional force programs at the Department of Corrections, recognizing that the federal government does pay for the ongoing cost, but there might be a cost associated with uh, getting those uh, programs at other Department of Corrections facilities in the state, not just the honor farm. So th those are two ideas I think we've identified today and there could be more. So that's the motion. Okay, it's sec uh, moved and seconded. Any discussion on that motion? All right, it's a conceptual, conceptual uh, motion. Other things could be added. I believe that our organization for advocates for the horses had some ideas on how they could, other ways they could be adopted out or sold. And that could fit into this as well. Um, 
Question being called. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Okay, let's have a raise of hands. All those in favor say aye or raise your hand. Mr. Chairman, my microphone or my camera isn't working, but my hand. You're an aye. Yes. Mr. Chairman, that was Representative Western. Okay. He's an aye. Okay. One. Is that five? Opposed? One, two, five. Two. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, you're an I. Yes. That'd be six, seven. <clears throat> Let's do it again. Westerns and I. Anybody else? Raise your hands. One, two, three, five. Six. All right. That that passes then. Okay. We had seven. Is it really? Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. Call, call for the nose. Oh, I have to call for the nose. Okay. Nose. Raise your hand. Six. Seven to six. Okay. Like I said. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, other other amendments. Huh? Just wondering how he got six. He didn't vote. I didn't vote. I didn't have to. Okay. Um, did you have any others? No, I think I'm good. Committee, do you have other amendments to put on this? Okay. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Go ahead, RJ. Like Microphone. Mike. I'm sorry, I'd like to amend on page seven. Uh, on lines one through five, I'd like to line three after land, put a period and eliminate the rest yeah. of as long as the private land comprises not more than 10% of the total area of the affected non federal lands. So I'd like to just remove that and say subsection may include private land. That would be my amendment. Well, so, well, let's see. Rather than Second. limiting it to 10%. Okay. Second, a little discussion on it is that we, well, that's still on, that's in the right section. Okay, that makes sense. And is everybody clear on that? We would eliminate any percentage of private land that needs to be on, on the plate of the state attorney general who might seek the writ of mandamus from the US government. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, that passes as well. So you just limp, you got it, don't you, Heather? Okay. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Cost. Any other amendments? Okay, we will continue to discuss this bill in at the next meeting, correct? Do we, or do you want to, okay, we'll vote on it. Is, oh, 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 oh. Okay, so Mr. Chairman, as you know, obviously it's a time to you know, voice any additional uh, perspectives you may have at this time. And I'll just pause here, make sure before I move to uh, move this bill as amended to the next meeting. Uh, so. um, I would just like to bring up for everybody to consider on page seven F uh, at the, the last word of sentence nine and the start of 10, you know, it, with any relevant party, that's a pretty broad statement. You know, I think that needs to be defined. Uh, who are those relevant parties? I mean, that, that's pretty broad sweeping uh, authority for the, uh, the governor, whoever that governor is, to um, work with different ones. You know, maybe it's a, a group that opposes any sterilization of wild horses or any uh, fertility uh, shots or anything. So I think that needs to be really uh, 
rethought or just those three words removed or uh, next month when we uh, we need to define that. That's just uh, my general comment on it. So, yeah, would you would you move to amend that out with any relevant parties? Yes, I would. Okay. Second. Then moved and seconded to amend out with any relevant parties. That'd be line nine and ten. So it would read it would read cooperative agreements, including the U.S. Bureau of Land Management. And second, in any discussion on that it, amendment, just yeah. to clarify, it's just those three words: any relevant party. Period. Just that. Okay. And wipe out including. So it would. Yeah. So it would say authorized on nine authorized to enter into cooperative agreements with the United States Bureau of Land Management. You're just taking out any relevant parties wording and including those four words just removed. Is there any discussion on that amendment? Are you taking out including? We're taking out include, not. Any relevant parties, correct? In, including, including, and that's, and it ends at including just those four words. Okay. Question. Okay, question being called, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that amendment passes. All right, any other amendments? So, what's the percentage of the way? Can you make another amendment? Just a second. Representative Worf. I still share uh, some concern. Uh, it was mentioned earlier that uh, we, the way this is written, we could have the potential to have one governor enter into an agreement that is going to obligate a future governor to abide by. And I don't know how we fix that, but I, I can tell you, I don't like the fact as, as we change the executive branch, you, you may change who, uh, who has that individual's ear, and you may in fact get conflicting uh, directives. So I, I'm just not sure how to fix that. I, I, I bring it up because I think, I don't want to stop it, but I, I think the committee, I would encourage the committee to think about how we fix this because I, I don't think it's fixed yet. I can't support it like this, but I think we got to figure out how, how we would address that so we don't get a situation where we have conflicts that we've created uh, by allowing one governor to obligate future governors. That's just my comment. Yeah. And I think I have that same concern with about every piece of legislation we pass, Representative Worf. It just it does it obligates future legislators to the same thing. And that's why we might need to try to clean it up as much as we can if we're going to pass this thing. So yeah. And just a, a few things to just immediately come to mind. You could require legislative approval for the agreement. You could put a time limit so it would expire with the funding. There are several options there. And I think, uh, yeah, it's at, and I, once again, I completely agree. This this section in particular needs more sideboards. We, we put about, you know, we, I think we are making progress by coming up with a list of things that are permissible, but presumably thing, uh, other things are not permissible. And make it, we probably need to work and make sure that that, um, is more clear in the bill. I just don't have a, a good words right now. That's why I'm looking at going to the next meeting. But I, I agree 100% Representative Worf, this concept needs uh, flushing out significantly. Okay, Representative Larson, comments. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to comment before we vote. Um, I, 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 I'm having difficulty with uh, the proposal at, uh, in total. I, uh, you know, the, the, I think we're gonna build government. Uh, we're gonna add more people to, to, you know, figure these numbers out. Um, I, I think they showed maybe $97,000 uh, 
we might get. We're, the government isn't going to pay us that. We all agree we have a big problem, but um, I, I don't know how to uh, how else to address it. But I'm going to be against uh, carrying this forward. I think we spent plenty of time on it. Yeah, I agree. We have a big problem. We're either going to increase government or increase horses, and either way, it's probably not a not a great deal. All right. Okay. Any more comments? I wouldn't come. Like I think this building's a little work, but I think there's some serious merits that we need to uh, keep alive at least till our next meeting. Uh, some of the some of the ability to work with with our uh, partners in the tribes, and I, I think there's some merits here. We have a little more work yet, but uh, I, I think I'll be voting for moving us forward. All right. If you have a motion, then. Sure, Mr. Chair, I move that we uh, 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 move this bill as amended to our next committee meeting. Sure. And seconded. Any discussion on that motion? All right. All those in favor? Let's see. Now, do, we don't need a a voice vote is all we need then. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay. I think that was probably passed, but let's go ahead and get a hand count in favor of continuing on with this bill into the next meeting as amended. Raise your hand. Six, seven. Representative Western has his hand up, Mr. Chairman. Eight. Okay, that would be eight. Um, uh, those opposed? Eight to five. Am I correct? Okay. So we will work on this in October and hopefully not to this extent, and hopefully we'll get it cleaned up. Um, I mean, not to this length of time during committee meeting but um and it's time for a break but i think it's lunchtime too so we're going to break for lunch and i'm not sure how quickly we can do that probably an hour mr chairman this is not a plug for this but there is a um, cafeteria on campus and my understanding is that it is open okay and it's just right across the courtyard right All over right. there would we be able to do it in a half an hour? Probably better. No. Okay, we'll stick with the hour. All right. So, Mr. Chairman, we're coming back at 12 at noon. We're coming. You're off at now. I'm sorry. We're coming back right. at one. We're coming back at one. One o'clock. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah. If I we're think? coming back at 12, it'd be five minutes from now. All right.